All right. So, I have no idea whether people can actually hear me this time. I certainly hope so. Let me check. Uh, uh, uh. Gotta get into the habit of checking. It's one of the things when you don't have people who view your videos live, sometimes you don't catch fuck ups when they happen. Ah, good, okay. There is, there seems to be sound. Ideal. So I'm going to keep the live chat open. As usual, I'm getting into the habit of that. All right. Live chat is in front of me. So, <clears throat> previously on this, uh, on Let's Learn Soil Taxonomy, we uh, were researching soil taxonomy. Who to thunk? All right, so I've got these fancy pictures of different types of soils, right? This is not the only way that these soils can look, but this is the common patterns with which different soil level, like, layers distribute themselves with other types of layers. It's a, it's a thing. Anyway, so I will be putting a grid here and one triangle one soil type. Very commonly, there will be a lot of soil types at, all together, and sometimes there will just be a tiny patch of soil all by itself, all by its lonesome. I need to figure out more about how the different soil types form in order to figure out how to code the patterns. So, um, for now, what I'm doing is I am creating images such as this. And I am labeling them in a way that makes them easy to code in. Because I will be passing this off to somebody somebody else to help me. Um, in order to prioritize my usefulness in a design capacity. Um, as opposed to a programming capacity. So right now I am doing what is unofficially known as bitch work which is just a derogatory way of saying mindless work that I don't want to have to be doing right now. So this one was south, so we gonna delete those. And then we're gonna, what is this? This is a shortcut is the S key. All right, cool, cool. I'm gonna slowly learn the shortcuts of this program. And around. One nice thing is, if you have one area that you need to select that needs to be straight, right? Like I need a straight line here because this is the smallest point, whereas I have more space all of the other sides. Then you start here, and then you go around all the big sides, and then the program will automatically make a straight line through the tiny side. So you have to do less fine detail control. It's nice. All right, so this is the west. And we gonna use the lasso tool, which I will one day do the shortcut for instead of clicking the button every time, but that day is not this five minutes. Okay. So, now I'm going to save these. So the previous one was the alpha soul, which I have not memorized what the fuck that means, but I don't need to yet. Uh, what is the other one called? The and andisol. Cool. All right, andisol. All right, so now I'm going to here here And and this all. Now this is my least favorite part of game design because I am creating placeholder images that I can only make as a designer 
at this point of time because I do not have subordinates who have the same level of design information as I do. But as you can see, I'm like, I took the screen resolution, right? I am going off the typical 16 by 9 resolution, and we have portrait. But in the future, I want the game to be able to switch between portrait and landscape, right? But for now, what we have is portrait. These are our boxes, and the boxes basically like... They're like a grid on a map, right? Except I've done a thing that you would be familiar with if you've ever played any kind of game where you have to set up tiles. Like, I used to really love uh, this Warcraft game. And it was called World of Warcraft or World of Warcraft 2, something like that. But there were cute little seals, and anytime any NPC or even my own people murdered the seals for meat, I murdered them back. Because those seals were under my protection. So, anyway, um, while I was doing that, you would put down tiles on, on the RPG Maker map screen if you went into that game mode, right? It would let you make your own map. And when you made your own map, uh, if you put two together right next to each other, like a unit of grass and a unit of snow, then they would blend together at the borders, right? So that is what I am trying to complete with this little grid thingy. And maybe I'll also need like an additional square, right? So the square will be the main focus of this tile, and then the undersides will be all of the tiles as they're being affected by those around them, right? And then the size of this tile will determine how much the ground is affected. So maybe this would be not very affected. Um, the stratification is pretty clear. And maybe this would be the stratification is not very clear, right? So this is a more blended area. And uh, I think that's probably what I'll do. I'll do it in three layers or like two layers. So the triangles are one layer and then the squares are, are a layer on top of that. Yeah, that sounds good. Renpy is good at, at doing image layers. So that I think is going to be my game dev process. So in that sense, I need to represent all of these different foil, soil types. Now, here's the thing. I have not learned enough to memorize how to paint these soil types and definitely not in a way that's going to grid aesthetically pleasing as they blend into one another. So instead, what I'm doing is I'm giving placeholder images while I research this other thing so that the programmer is not held back by my uh, current level of incompetence in the field of soil taxonomy and geology and shit, you know, whatever. So the idea is both of us are working on something at the same time. That way nobody is waiting for anybody else and we get what is known as max efficiency. Yes, efficiency is nice. I live by efficiency. It is how I do everything that I do. Um, at least I try. Anyway, so I've already done the alpha souls and I just finish up the end of souls. And so I just have to move up through the soil taxonomy like this doing this very boring and repetitive task where I collapse the thing into one layer, I undo it so I don't actually accidentally save over this file, because that would suck. I save it here just in case I need it, like I forgot what I was doing, and then I overwrite all of these, and I do not save them yet because that would overwrite the last file that I did. Now I fix up the file, so this one was north, so we're going to go with north here, and we're going to delete that, and then we're going to get this. Like, this is a definitely a repetitive task that I would adore uh, making it automatic with, like, I don't know, some kind of macro or some kind of plugin for paint.net. That would be cool. But as of yet, 
I do not have one. And I do not want to invest in the time in making one myself. So, I am doing it by hand. Like a pleb. Unfortunately, that is just life when you do not have the proper tool that you need. So, I will continue doing this. Thankfully, there's what? I don't know, not that many. There's like 13 of them. I have to do it four times each time, which is, um, I don't know, more than I want to do. So, 13 times 4, that's going to be 40 plus 12. So 40 plus 12 is going to be 52. Ugh, oh no. Just thinking about it makes me feel sick. I have to do 52 of these. That's all right. They go fast. Don't get yourself down. So we are in the south quadrant. The point is, when you have a huge amount of tasks in front of you, don't actually calculate. Calculate only when there's something you can do about it. Right? So... If it is not a huge investment in time, and I can just easily find a macro that will do this for me, then I would invest in that instead of doing this bullshit task. Maybe I'll invest in it later if I find that I have to do a lot of repetitive stuff. But uh, for now, for now we're just going to put up with the inefficiency that is secretly efficient if you squint hard enough. Because it is not worth it for me to write my own plugin and then have to learn how to make plugins and then all of that nonsense. Okay. So then I look at the name and I check that I have the correct name. Aridisol, like arid. Alright. So now we're going to rename this Arisol. And because I'm lazy, I'm just going to copy that. And I'm going to save this one. And just paste it in there. And I just keep doing this. The key to being good at this type of busy work, I guess is what it's called, is to get your workflow process done. So, I don't think I need this thing, so I'm gonna get rid of it. Okay, so we've got that. Now we're moving on to the Entisol. So we're gonna flatten it, copy it, undo, undo. And now we're just gonna paste into all of these. And then, that's annoying, Entisol, okay, Entisol, and we're starting with North, and delete those, give ourselves that lasso tool, yoink, yeah, you want to balance efficiency with whatever makes the task not boring, so like sometimes being, making your task really efficient is bad because it causes you to become bored, or it causes me to become bored. So, uh, n, no, ent is soul. So that is how I manage surviving my life with my extremely ADD brain. All right, all right, all right. Lots of letters. So as you can see, these would not be good for a final game because they're not very information dense. It does not provide very much information about uh, the Earth. Color is much faster at that. Um, for people who aren't colorblind and for people who are, there is still light and darkness, a.k.a. In the art community, we call that value. And then additionally, there is satur uh, saturation. And saturation also has to do with... Oh, I saved this before I edited it. That's less than ideal. 
I get distracted when I'm talking and then I start fucking up my process. My workflow gets confused, the wires get crossed, and all hell breaks loose. Kind of what I imagine my mast cells are like. Okay, um, west. Alright, here we go. Cells at Work is such a great show. As a chronically ill person, Cells at Work did so much to allow me to, like, accept my body the way it is. Because instead of thinking that my body is, like, this enemy that is secretly trying to, like, murder me, I see my body as just, like, a really shittily run thing that the infrastructure is bad. And no one knows what to do because all of their bosses are stupid. And incompetent. So, uh... Definitely helped me give myself a bit more compassion. And not treat myself as my own enemy just because I'm sick and... That's inconvenient. But it's inconvenient only because I don't have enough help. If I had enough help, I would be fine. You know? Um... And there are some awesome things that help with that. For example, caregiving programs are great. Um, caregiving programs in... So I live in Washington State. And I became severely disabled to the point where I was bedridden 80% of the day. Uh, in my 20s, my early, my early 20s. We're still on east? Okay, east is good. We haven't fucked up yet. So, in my 20s... Oh, right. VTuber lore. So, I've decided recently that my VTuber lore is... That... Noain is a dimension hopper. And... The body that they are inhabiting is from planet Earth. And the mind is affected by the body. So if you borrow somebody's body, your mind merges with theirs to a degree. And then even if you leave later, part of them will always be with you and part of you will always be with them. It's kind of like friendship, but like to the max. And if you've ever played Cyberpunk, the whole thing that's happening with... Uh, with... Johnny Silver, Silver, some macho manly name they gave him, Silver Cash, Silver Slash, whatever. Johnny Silver, maybe. That just flows off the tongue better. I have not played the game yet. Um, I've only watched other people play, which is why my memory is a bit foggy. But anyway, so, um, Jealous Soul. Jealous Soul, Jealous Soul, Jealous Soul. Jealous soul. Okay, we got it. We got it here. Alright, remember to look at the YouTube chat. Okay, nothing going on in the YouTube chat. We're good. Jealous soul. So I've copied that, saved it. Alright, continuing on. So what the hell was I saying? Um, I was talking about disability, and then I was talking about programs that are good, and then I was talking about how I became disabled in my early 20s, and... It wasn't until I was almost 30 that I even found out that there was a caregiving program in my state that helps people who are middle class and below afford caregiving. Like, because caregivers are very expensive, right? Which makes sense, because if, for example, you need 24-hour care and you want to pay, pay another person who is the caregiver a hourly wage or a fair wage for their time, right? Um, you would have to pay way more money than you are able to create to generate for yourself, right? It's just a cost loss thing, right? Losses or additions, if we're talking in uh, soil, which is what we're talking about right now, right? So we're talking about soil, so we might as well do that. And, uh, basically, 
in soil, the study of soil and geography. And addition is when new materials such as organic material or new dust and minerals comes into an ecosystem. And um, losses are when it leaves. For example, when it's blown away by the wind, when it is carried away by an animal, um, or when it is like... float away by the water, right? Like water carries it off somewhere. So basically the soil isn't going anywhere unless somebody kidnaps it, right? Soil just wants to live its life wherever it is. That's the whole point of rocks, right? Rocks are just very clustered and usually dense, but sometimes not dense if it's like a pumice rock. But it's like a stable uh alloy of non-metal minerals right i don't know if the word alloy can be used for things that aren't metal but uh if it can't be there should be a similar word that's used for things that aren't that uh where were we here we're histosol like history okay so Hist isol, and we're gonna copy that, save it. All right. So anyway, as I was saying, um, right, additions and subtractions. Yeah. So the economy, and when you're disabled, there was this study I read a while back, um, about. How people, it was a study of disability and income in uh, the United States, which is where I live and thus what I am the most educated about. Um, generally speaking, occasionally I will take a fancy to learning about another country's culture or plants or whatever, but usually I'll learn about things that affect me more directly. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of people will naturally fall into that category of learning more about things that affect them more and learning less about things that affect them less because it's a good way to maximize your energy usage and learn the things that are going to improve your life more drastically. So anyway, um, one day I'll learn to stay on topic. But that day is not in this next five minutes. In septisol. Okay. That's okay, though, because I'm just chatting while I do this, like, really repetitive and awful task. In septisol. All right. And the nice thing is, if I ever spell this wrong, I have a bulk rename utility. So I can just change them all at once. What is most important is that I name them all the same thing, whether that thing is correct or whether it is wrong. Um, it doesn't matter if I name all of them the wrong thing, because that is easy to fix with programming. What does matter is if I name them the wrong thing, and what matters even more is if I name them the wrong thing, and it doesn't even have the same number of characters in it. Ugh. The bulk rename utility does not like that. Um, so, anywho, let me take that brief moment to, uh, advertise the bulk rename utility because I like them and they deserve it. They're not paying me or anything. It's free, but this is a really nice program that I support. And uh, I guess there's a commercial version that's used for commercial purposes and I don't have to worry about that because I'm not making any money. At least yet. Maybe one day. One day I will thrive as a corporate shill but anyway, so as I was saying, um, I need to get better at like organizing my thoughts so that the information follows easy to understand trains. So what I was saying is, um, 
I was very young, just in college when I became so sick that I went from being able to hike, uh, you know, 10, 15 miles and go on multiple day camping trips. Um, and I changed from that to not being able to sit up in bed for six months at my worst, right? So that is my peak versus my worst point, uh, physically speaking, right? Um, and my peak, I was still at my peak in early college, and then I rapidly lost that um, during college. And I have theories for that, but now is not the time for Noane's weird-ass medical theories. Um, that would probably be in a dream video, because it would be stuff I haven't researched yet, but would like to research in the future. So, anywho... Um, on that note, that is something that I added and I put a lot of attention to detail into for the creation of my channel is I made, um, I decided what type of content I would spend the most time streaming or just like producing. And I'm mostly doing streams because I hate video editing. Maybe one day I'll be popular enough that people do it for me and they make highlight rules for me. But until then, uh, I'm just going to do my best with streaming because that's easy. And I actually have a Camtasia license and, you know, I like Camtasia. I started using it when I was a uh, Mollusol. I started using it when I was working for a nonprofit organization called the Trans Youth Channel. Um, apparently it was started by or with Cat Black, who is another YouTuber that I follow. Um, and the CEO was Samantha Logan when I was there. And I think it rebranded into, uh, rescue net after I left. So it has changed brands. I think that Samantha was going to like move to New Zealand or something. Who knows? In any case, I really had a bad time working in that organization. Um, not due to maliciousness, which is nice. You know, it's always nice when you don't have mal malicious intentions, uh, at your job or at your place of work, but you can still have a bad work environment through negligence rather than malice. And that's really more what it was. Um, and the negligence was combined with incompetence, right? Um, so the incompetence caused the negligence, or the negligence caused the incompetence. Chicken and an egg scenario, really. But at least while I was there, it was a hot mess. And I ended up, at some point, working, like, five high-level positions. Like, I was their social media team lead. And then I was also the main person who edited videos. Like, there was another person who was the main person, but I think that they were kind of training somebody to help their workload. And so at certain points, I ended up with greater workload. And then they trained each person who made videos to um, do their own editing, but a lot of people didn't do their own editing. And because they didn't do their own editing, it would fall on whoever was free. And because I generally like to be a helpful person, I am, at that age, I was pretty easy to, I want to say take advantage of, but it's not as if people take advantage of you in pur on purpose in that type of situation. Like in a nonprofit situation, 
which I later had more experience with nonprofits, right? Um, in a nonprofit situation, you people take like suck the blood out of each other, but it's not usually done with ill intention. It's done because there's so much work to do and so little funding and so little time and so little resources of all types, energy, time, emotions. Um, everybody is stretched so thin that the instant new blood comes into the nonprofit, they get jumped on like piranhas. And then all of the nonprofits in the area just suck that person dry for as much volunteer work as they can get before the person burns out because the burnout level is so high in nonprofits. And this can cause some really sketchy shit um, that, you know, nobody orchestrated it from evil means, but negligence is in the wrong places and it causes fuck shit to happen, okay? It just causes fuck shit. Um, I think this is Oxisol. I should have sounded it out. Uh, we're just going to go with that, and if it's wrong, I will edit it later. So, anywho. It's okay to make mistakes as long as you make mistakes that are easy to fix. Um, mistakes that are hard to fix have worse consequences. So, generally don't do them. Alright, so, copy and paste. Chatting about random things does make this much less mind torturous. Um, even though, because I'm spending so much energy, like, dedicated to these repetitive tasks, I am straying off topic a lot. So, whatever. Um, so as I was saying, nonprofits can often get into these situations where, like, um, I ex I, I used to have a roommate and, uh, we were good friends. We were online friends. We met through the nonprofit actually that I talked about the, uh, what is now called rescue net, unless they've rebranded again. Um, and like I said, I was working like five jobs there at one point and it got really overwhelming and I had to quit. So I started working there when I got sick because I like to keep myself busy and I thought, oh no, if I get sick and I can't work for a period of time because it came to the realization that I was going to have to quit my job, right? I just couldn't feasibly do it. I did hold on for quite a long time and the college that I worked at was great. It was the place that I graduated from and they treated me, um, they treated me really well and they were really flexible with me. And that was mostly because my boss um, and the the super, super higher up dude um, person R was like really boss R was uh, great. And boss C, who was my direct supervisor, was also great. And then a lot of the specialists were great, right? So like. I worked tech support there, and uh, I was one of the front desk people. Spot a soul. Okay, spot a soul. Spot a soul. Spot o soul. Is it spot o soul or spot is soul? Spot o soul. Okay, I was right. I kind of feel like I'm telling myself like spell names here. No wonder scientists got called magicians and shit. Got all these special languages, dead languages known only to them. That's why spells are always written in Latin, and then, like, old school chemists also are always in Latin. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm just going to let myself be as ADD as I want. <laughs> And I'm going to say that if anybody finds a specific topic interesting and I dropped it and I forgot to go back to it, 
if somebody just talks about it in the chat, then I'll get back to it at another time. And if nobody talks about it in the chat, then I'm going to assume nobody gives a shit and I'm just going to do what I want. <laughs> and what my brain wants to do is just wander from topic to topic without ever finishing anything. So uh, if I do that, I can sacrifice my ADD to the unimportant conversation and then I can get my concentration on the actual productive task which is finishing this boring ass graphics so that I can program things. Okay, so as I was saying, I was talking about nonprofits and how they get sketchy. And I was telling a story chronologically, but then I wasn't telling it. I keep jumping between chronologies, and I'm sure that's very confusing. So I'll just start from the beginning and then move towards the end. It's so confusing because I think I try to group my conversations by connected topics. Um, and then the connected topics all blend together into this big stream of consciousness. But if you're trying to give a presentation or make something easy to understand then you kind of need to group it based off of, like, something more concrete than that. I guess if somebody is just vibing with you, then it doesn't really matter if your conversation flows from one thing to the next, because all you're really doing is spending time together, right? You're not telling anybody any information with any sort of importance, and I guess that's how I share personal stories, right? Like... I'm not placing a lot of importance on them. I'm just doing it to allow people on the stream to get to know me better. So, ult is soul. Because I think that's why people watch streamers, you know? Um, like, ult is soul. Part of it is to learn skills, right? Like, I have some streams that I watch specifically for, like, tutorials, whatever. And then I have some stuff that I watch for educational purposes when I want to watch pretty grass, uh, graphics, but I also want to learn something like Kyrgyzot. I love Kyrgyzot. Kyrgyzot is amazing, and I watch it often. Um, and then there's some that I will watch when I want to learn something, and I also want to feel like I'm on a drug trip, like Exerbia, you know? Um... Uh, is Exerbia the one? I always get Exerbia's name mixed up. I think it's Exerbia. Or is it... Okay, yeah. Exerbia and that other dude are just two different types of drug trips. Like, Exerbia is the dude who does philosophy. And so his videos are kind of like... Very thoughtful drug trips. Like... Where you're following... It's like Ursula K. Le Guin is one of my favorite authors, right? So she has this quote about fiction, about how fiction is a, or science fiction specifically as a genre, is meant to hold a mirror to human nature, right? That is the purpose of science fiction. It reflects human nature back at us by examining how human nature changes in response to the environment, right? And romance as a genre, uh, she didn't say this part, but romance as a genre, from my interpretation, extrapolating on her idea, is that, um, so for romance as a genre, it's about reflecting human behavior as it's affected by other humans, right? So romance is about person-to-person -person relationships, and slice of life often fits into the romance genre, even if nobody ever dates anybody else, right? You could argue that harem as a genre, and that counts for both uh, shoujo and jose harem, as well as shonen and seinen harem, right? So the way that the... English language separates 
novel genres and categorizes them is different from other countries, right? So in Japan, they actually just directly tell you what group they're marketing to, which can be pretty useful, right? Shoujo means it is marketed at young girls, right? So shoujo is anywhere from the start of puberty into like forever, really, but it encompasses a certain brand of idealism about human relationships, right? And shonen is the same way, except shoujo concentrates on lovers and shonen concentrates on friendship, right? So shonen is is the adventure genre, right? So the adventure genre is about friendship and changing the world with your friends, right? Usually there is some bad thing happening and then you have to change that bad thing with the power of friendship and also grit. So basically like personal integrity. It's really about cultivation of the self into a person who you want to be, right? That is what media in Japan that is targeted at young boys is. And I think that as we progress as a society, like, these genres are becoming less gender differentiated. So I have been a fan of anime and manga since the um, early 90s. And I have an enormous manga wall, which... You know, maybe I'll show you guys pictures one day. Um, I have over a thousand volumes of manga that I've been collecting uh, at very point, various points in my life. About 800 of them I collected before I left high school. And then the other 200 I've collected since then. The reason for that is that I just simply had more disposable income when I was a child compared to an adult. And uh, as an adult, I have to spend money on... on you know, other stuff, right? Um, taking care of my health and my home and my spouse and my cat, children, um, and my, uh, everybody, right? People and things that are important to me, I've narrowed it down more. When I was younger, I consumed a lot of manga and anime because as a young autistic child, I was very confused by the world. <laughs> I did not understand how other people functioned, how they worked. Um, I didn't understand any of that. And it made no sense to me. And the reason why I really loved manga, and I read both shonen and shoujo manga, uh, and I would occasionally also read jo Jose and Seinen, and traditionally, Jose started off, uh, Jose is traditionally aimed at older women, and Seinen was traditionally aimed at older men, but that's the genre that became gender neutral way earlier in its development, right? So Seinen has been gender neutral since the early 90s when I was there, even though originally when, the, when it came about, it was primarily older men. But um, that, that style that they picked for that was so appealing to so many people across gender lines that the genre ceased to be designated in that way, right? Um, and I think that in the future, that is going to happen more and more, right? So in, uh, in English and with like the Dewey Decimal System and whatnot, books are sorted by topic and category, rather than the type of person who will read the book, right? And I think that that has a lot to do with, um, in the United States at least, our very strong attachment to freedom of information, right? Because if you think of freedom of speech, freedom of information is even more core to what makes a society free. Because if information is not free, then you cannot make up your own mind about things, right? 
So I think that the U.S. has been very freedom of speech in the past, but controlled its population through controlling who gets what information, right? Poor people get shittier information, and so they are less able to lift themselves out of poverty. They are less able to change their environment and the world and society. Rich people were able to change more because they had more resources. Some rich people would have very little time resource, but lots of money. And some would have the opposite, right? Those are the cultural stereotypes we have about, like, the rich, wealthy, hedonistic young master, right? That's an example of a person who has lots of free time and lots of money. And they use it in a hedonistic way. And through living their hedonistic lives, they fund different industries that cater to their needs. For example, the alcohol industry, drug industry, the sex industry, um, comfortable bed industry, comfortable clothes industry. Or if it's less about comfort and it's more about getting people to fuck you, then decorative clothes industry, decorative uh um, decorative household goods, de decorative furniture, right? So because they have lots of money, they would gear the economy to be centered around luxury goods, right? So luxury goods were where most of the money went into and everyone else had to starve, right? That is historically... Uh, precursor societies to the one that we live in now such as like feudalistic societies or like um maybe whatever right any society where there's a large gap between the rich and the poor uh luxury goods become higher valued than or not higher valued but they're in more frequent circulation compared to uh, necessity goods like food, anything that you need for personal hygiene, um, anything that you need for basic mental health care, right? It's basic stress relief, um, that kind of stuff, right? Uh, so what I'm trying to get at is traditionally, if you look at the U.S. history, we have a lot of politics around education and a lot of politics around what is allowed to be written into history books, into science books, into that kind of stuff. In fact, I read once, and I'm not, let me look it up because um, I, I don't know if it's still accurate and I should keep myself accurate. Anytime I remember information, I should refresh that information. So I remember reading an article about how Texas was the state that determined what uh, books get published for public schools. Texas public school books, right? So Texas's fight over school books, that's one. How ten, yeah, how Texas inflicts bad textbooks on us, right? So what happens in Texas doesn't stay in Texas when it comes to textbooks. Um, let's see, I'm just gonna, you can read this later. I'm gonna copy it and I'm gonna add it to, let me pull up a notepad and anything that I mention during the stream, I'll just, if there's a link to it, I'll post a link and then I'll post it in the comments after the stream is over. Um, that way people can find out more if they want because I, I encourage you to do your own research, right? So um, if you don't trust the New York Times, eh, save the article, go, go look it up somewhere else, right? Um, I'm just going to judge based on the quality of information as I see it, but I'm always open to changing it if uh, I find out that I accidentally looked at a video on stream that was not uh, scientifically kosher. So this one I do not have a subscription to, so I'm not going to look at this one. Um, I mean, I'll look at least the beginning, right? So, do, 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 do. All right. 
the Board of Education. Uh huh. Oh, okay. So this is where the politics comes in that I was talking about, right? See, I have been reading uh, royal politics. You know, I think that's one reason why medieval medieval uh, Europe is so popular and why, like, harem drama in the East is so popular is because those are really fiction that are meant to teach you about politics and, like, the very complex play of interpersonal relationships when somebody's interests are on the line. So, um... Even though things are not now as dramatic as they are in those stories where like, I'm not a, I'm not a lonely prince who's been raised from birth under a, uh, uh, under the wrath of a concubine who murdered my mother and couldn't murder me because of, uh, legal reasons like too many other political parties support my mother's house, but they managed to kill off my mother and then I got to raise myself into adulthood through pretending to be um, incompetent or hedonistic or not interested in politics while secretly raising an information network on my own, right? And the concubine is uh, an evil bitch, and she has a son who is my half-brother. And I actually have a good relationship with my half-brother. I love him, but the thing is that his mother has been abusing him his whole life and trying to control him to put him on the throne because she has a desire for power, right? She hungers for power because she had a really abusive childhood and she knows that only when she is the most powerful person in this earth will no one be able to hurt her, right? Maybe she has a tragic backstory that led her to... to to think like this, right? So I have a good relationship with my brother when we were children, but as we got older, we spaced and distanced apart because his mom kept trying to assassinate me, and I found out that any time I told him something, he would tell her something, and then she would know my schedule, and then she would assassinate me. So I was forced to cut off my brother from knowing about what's going on in my life so that his abusive mother did not try to assassinate me, okay? So you see the kind of dynamics that happen in stories that have a strong amount of politics. And uh, here I'm going to categorize politics as being about... Um, so if adventure, very frequently, adventure has a subtype of like action. In an action film, the protagonist is following the general adventure archetype. Now in adventure the point is you and your best buds and your friends and your whole community network whatever are going to you've identified something in the world that sucks and you are working together to change that thing. And that thing could be something that affects only you or it could be something that affects a country or a world. It really depends on the scale. For example uh, in uh, what's, what's a good, uh, like a sports or, a? there's this new anime that just came out about a guy who is, um, who really loves making these and like antique style, uh, Japanese dolls, right? I forget the name. Um, doll making anime. Let's look it up real quick here. So, a romance between a cosplayer and a doll maker. Yeah, that's it. So, there's this anime called My Dress Up Darling. And uh, Korachun, um really wanted me to watch it. So, I, I've been watching a little bit of it with him. And it, it's kind of cute along the lines of several other uh, hobbyist-style romances. Which, I gotta say, hobbyist-style romances are a really perfect blend between shonen and shoujo or between romance and adventure, right? Um, another good one was, what was it called? There's that girl who has the red ribbon with white polka dots on it. Uh, Nozaki-kun, maybe? Yeah, Nozaki-kun. Uh, so the monthly shoujo magazine Nozaki-kun is another in this kind of blended of romance and adventure. Um... And then another one would be, what's it called? What's it called? It's about an office romance. 
between people who are gamers, gamer, office, romance, anime. Let's see if I can find it from there. Uh, 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 I think it's this one. Yeah, this is it. Are you going to tell me the title or you're not going to tell me the title? Okay, I have to watch the video to get the title, even though I know that I'm on the right one. Oh, because it's a list. Okay, this is a list. No, we're not going to. This is the wrong one. Wotakoi. That's it. Wotakoi. Wotakoi. Yeah. So Wotakoi, love is hard for an otaku. So this is another one in the same genre, right? So, in my opinion, adventure as a genre is about community relationships. And romance is about individual relationships. And so if you combine those two, then you get a, a media, like an anime, that has broad spectrum appeal. And it doesn't divide itself among gender lines the way that traditional media does, right? Which, personally, I think is really valuable. And I think that that's a really great way for society to go into. So, Wotakoi fits this category because um, it is about these two otaku or nerds, right? Uh, she is really into... They're both really into gaming. But she is more committed to not looking like a nerd than he is, Right? Because she's had some bad experiences where she was like lost friends or was shamed or something. I don't remember. And maybe he's just always been a loner and he doesn't really give a shit if he loses friends. So he's just going to be his nerdy self and he keeps it professional at work because he doesn't want to get fired from his job. That's what he values. But he doesn't make friends with people who are going to judge him for his interests. She makes friends with normies. And because she's friends with normies, she's like the social butterfly of the nerd ecosystem, right? So he would be like core nerd, as in, I'm a nerd that only interacts with other nerds. If you're not a nerd, you can't talk to me. I'm very exclusive. Whereas she's more like, I'm a nerd, but I also, you know, hang out with people who like more socially acceptable hobbies like makeup and dating and drinking, uh, binge drinking alcohol, right? So, um, and then there's also these two, which are another couple that is a, uh, very mature, sexy, dominant cosplayer. Her main hobby is cosplaying and, um, making her own photo shoots and costumes. His main hobby... I want to say it was dating sims, but I, I, I don't remember. Um, his main hobby is, I think, man, I think it's like JRPGs, but I think it's more like MMOs. Like, he likes tactics, and he likes just being better than other people. And then her thing is, she likes playing games, and I think she's also very competitive, but... Um, I think that she invests more of her self-identity on, like, friends, community, having more people, and being well socially adapted. And she cares about that equally as much as she cares about being good at games. Whereas he cares more about games and less about being socially adapted to n normies, right? So that's just the difference. She cares about being able to move through m normie space, and he doesn't care. Because nerd space is big enough for him, and that's a big enough territory, and he's he's good there. She requires a larger territory in order to be happy, and a, a larger diversity among her friends groups in order to, like, keep herself um, centered and level and have a good temperament. So she, um, psychologically and socially, has a larger territory with um, lots of different things. So if you think about it in terms of ecology, right? Um, maybe uh, maybe he would be like an eagle or a wolf, right? So they'll spend most of their time alone and they won't really congregate together. And then maybe she'll be more like um, a cat or... Uh, 
not all types of cats though only specifically house cats or like the type of african cat that forms clans and they all visit each other very frequently and have like a social network but then they also do their own thing independently you know and then somebody who would be even less individualistic than her i guess um I don't know which of these that would be, though, because maybe him. He has the most shame about his hobbies. I think he hides it the most. Um, so that would be more like, you know, uh, deer, sheep, cow, like herbivores, or maybe rabbits, um, socially speaking. Like, no, I think rabbits would be more his type if he were less confident. So maybe that does fit him, because I don't think he's super social butterfly-y. So if he's less social butterfly, he'll be rabbit. And if he's more social butterfly, then he'll be some type of like herd animal, you know? Um, so a pack is a small herd, right? So he would be a solitary or a pack animal. She would be a pack animal that has a very large roaming territory. Whereas he would be one that has a small territory where he knows everyone inside of it. And he doesn't know what's beyond that small area and he doesn't need to. Um, she likes to wander. So she is more like, you know, Horo and Lawrence from Spice and Wolf. They gather and they go to all sorts of different cities and they meet other people. And then they invest in each of those people a certain amount. But the person who comes with her on her journey, that is the person who is truly close to her. Right? So that is my analysis of their kind of social situation. Um, so I think I was talking about genres before I got off on this random tangent. Check the YouTube chat. Okay. So before I got off on this random tangent, I was talking about genres. So like shoujo genre is typically, like I said, it's based off of very intense one-on-one -on -one personal relationships. And shonen is more about a friend group. Um, so romance could technically be about best friends and actually a lot of Yuri try to hide the fact that they're very gay by making it about best friends. It's kind of like blending the lines between romantic and platonic, um, which is interesting because some people do that more and I am one of those people and then other people, they're very distinctly different, right? So for me, I don't feel closer to a romantic partner than I do to my best friend. For me, those are like pretty close to be on the same level. If I have a best friend who's really there for me, they're going to be on the same level. If I have a best friend who's consistently let me down, they're not going to be the same level, right? Um, as a romantic partner who's really there for me. But a romantic partner who kept letting me go down might be a lower priority than a best friend who's always there for me, right? So for me, that's how I cognate and organize my human relationships, my human relationship ecosystem. But for other people, uh, you know, like they would not function that way. For example, they would never date anyone that they've gotten to know too much. Um, they only make friends with people who keep an air of mystery because without that air of mystery, they can't see that person romantically or sexually. Like that person is they have some secrets that I don't have access to yet, and it keeps me interested in them. You know, um, it's a very passionate-based romance um, versus the companionate base, right? So I think that the honeymoon phase of relationships often starts out with a lot of passion because you're still learning new things about each other. And then once you are stable and you're not learning new things about each other anymore, you often switch into more of companionate. And then from there, a relationship can then merge into neglect when both people are neglecting each other and their own personal character growth, right? So in my opinion, in a healthy relationship, both people are constantly experiencing character growth and that keeps interest up right you'll never get bored of each other because that other person is changing in new and interesting ways that you also think are changing them for the better and not the worse 
and you enjoy being around them and you learn new things with their, when you're with them and you learn new things that you want to learn and sometimes you just admire the way their brain works way better than you at a specific region. Um, you know, and to me, that's what romance is, right? It's like this process of getting to know somebody and becoming progressively deeper with them. But for me... I get the same thing out of a platonic deepening of a relationship that I do out of a romantic one. So maybe I'm just aromantic and I can't tell the difference between the two. Or maybe I'm a pattern where the line between romantic and platonic is very blurred for me. And uh, I instead just separate it by who it's socially acceptable to have what level of physical contact with, honestly, right? Um, because my relationships are just honestly very gradient. You know, they're very fluid. I don't put my relationships into as clear and tidy boxes as some other people do. Um, a lot of people put their relationships into very clear and tidy boxes. And for their relationships, they will be like, Oh, hey, I see somebody in the chat, but I don't know if that's me. It was zero before, so it's probably not me. Hello, welcome. I, uh have this stream because I was doing this and then I did I finish it is that what happened and then I got off topic because I finished it oh no I had one left I'm just scum um right back on topic all right so I have been wandering about various topics here um, while I am making placeholder images for the Fuck Sakai game, which I can say now because it's no longer the start of the stream. According to YouTube, apparently you can't use those words in the title or in the beginning of the stream, but you can pepper it artistically throughout. Um, in any case, yeah, so I was just going through and doing this extreme busy work and then wandering off on various random topics mostly to keep myself entertained while I do it because it's very boring uh to make placeholder buttons I mean it's not even the final art it doesn't look pretty it's just meant to be informational so that we can put the button in the right place and then I can replace it with nicer art later on so um while I was doing that I wandered off on a bunch of different topics um let me see if i can think of any important ones so i talked a bit about disability um because i am chronically ill there's a lot of really good chronically ill vtubers um like iron mouse i love iron mouse iron mouse is great and it's so great to see another disabled pe person out there just like living their best digital life. And uh, that did help me motivate myself to start streaming, um, you know, like Iron Mouse and Nyaners. And um, I also really like Vox Akuma. And then there's a few that I follow on Twitter, but I haven't seen many of their videos yet. Um, but anyway, um, there we go. Let's save this a better actually figure out what it's named first okay what have we got here vertisol okay vertisol which is a soil type that i researched in my last video on soil taxonomy vertisol okay sound it out to spell it out is how you learn to pronounce things incorrectly honestly but it does help with memory so you know, whatever works. So I've got all of these little things. I'm getting myself on topic now that somebody's actually in the chat and paying attention. <laughs> so as I was saying, um, yeah, so what I'm doing here. So I've sorted out, um, I'm going to generate a planet. For the end goal of the game, I need to generate multiverses, but that's big goals for the future, and I'm keeping myself on track for that, but I need to start small, right? 
So game design principles, you want to always start from working code. That means you should have a playable game that you're always adding on to. You should not spend a huge amount of time on something that is not playable and not fun because one, your code is going to suck because you're going to work on it for forever and then you'll never play test it and then suddenly you'll try to play it and then it's full of errors because you fucked everything up and you didn't learn as you went along because you never corrected your mistakes as you went along, right? It's the same with cooking. The reason why you need to cook and then taste at each step in the process is to make sure that you're layering the spices properly, right? You layer the flavors programming same way, right? Um, if you just follow the recipe in programming and you rush to the end, you're going to end up with a dish that tastes like shit. And what I mean by tastes like shit is it's going to, um, what I mean by tastes like shit is that you're going to end up with a lot of broken garbled code that makes no goddamn sense and it's going to be terrible. Just, just trust me on this, Okay. Um, it is a well-documented fact of the programming world that you need to always start from a working code and a playable game that you expand out from if you ever want to get anything done, right? That's, that's just life and you don't want it to be full of bugs. So my goal, um, and I'll, I'll go into... Where is it? In my Discord. Is it my to-do list? Right. So in my to-do list, on here, uh, when I was going over game development, I was like, all right, so how am I going to decide what is the smallest playable game that I could possibly make while making it compatible with the big dreams that I have, right? I have all these big dreams, but I need to determine when which features need to be added. Otherwise, you end up in what is known as feature creep where you keep coming up with ideas and you're really bad at implementing those ideas. So you just implement an idea as soon as it comes into your head, right? You come up with an idea and you immediately start working on it. This is a very bad way to do game design because you will end up with something that sounds really good on paper and then you put it into the game and then it just sucks, right? And maybe it could be really good if you polish it, but it's the first draft, right? It's just like in writing where you're supposed to write a first draft and then a second draft and you keep editing and polishing it. You do the same thing when you make a video game, right? So you start out with your outline and your general idea of what the scope of your end project will be. And then you narrow it down into the smallest possible game that anyone could ever play and not want to shoot themselves from playing, okay? And since I'm making a game that I want to play, I'm going to make the smallest possible game that I will enjoy. And if other people are like me, they will also enjoy it. If other people aren't like me, then maybe certain parts of the gameplay that I coded in just won't get used, right? Yeah, it sucks, but it happens. So anyway, <clears throat> I was deciding, how do you decide where to start? I have an idea for a game. How do I turn that into code, right? How do I turn my idea for my game into reality? That's really the basic question that you have to start with, right? So how do you decide when you have such a large idea? Like, I want to make a game that is based off of isekai and system novels and, you know, all of the the early 90s inspirations that I had about people getting transported to other worlds, like, um, you know, there's Fushigi Yugi, there's Inuyasha, there's Red River, there's, um, you know, uh, what was that really good one that I liked? The s not the Seven Kingdoms, the 13th Kingdom? No. One of those was a Disney movie or something. Um... Ah, uh, let me look up the anime. It's going to bother me now. Where's the Seven Kingdoms anime? 13? The Kingdom Isekai anime. It's the girl with the red hair. No, th we're looking for something older here. Uh, red hair woman. 
Is that gonna? Yeah, the Twelve Kingdoms. Oh, I was close. All right, the Twelve Kingdoms. That that is a really one of my big inspirations for sure. And then I also really like system novels. Um, I read a lot of them just because I read so many hours of the day. So when I got sick from disability, I spent all of my time reading because that was the only thing I could do, right? I couldn't lift my head off of the pillow, so I couldn't sit, I couldn't lay down on my back, right? Because if I laid down on my back, if I wanted to look at my phone, I had to hold the phone up and I literally did not have the strength to do it. So I would have to turn on my side and then I would have to lay one arm on the bed and then just keep it propped up my phone so that I could like scroll, right? That is like the lowest energy. Well, the lowest, lowest energy is just laying there and staring at the ceiling, right? Because you literally have no energy to even like, you can't lift your head off of the pillow to get a drink, right? There were some dark years in my life uh, where this flesh vessel was literally just, I think my record was like six months. I didn't get out of bed in six months. I was developing bed sores, which are like pressure sores um, in your body. And those suck. It's like your body just starts eating itself, basically. Um, so thankfully I don't have that problem anymore because I'm not that sick anymore. Yay, modern medicine. Um, and the few helpful doctors out of the many unhelpful doctors that I have encountered in this, in this life of mine. Um, right. So I brought up disability for a reason. I was talking about game design. How do you decide when to start on such a big project? You want to always start from working code and then expand outward to um, expand the working code that you have instead of just like start with an overly ambitious project. You need to put things into bite-sized pieces and you need to know how everything works together. It requires something called systemic thinking. Now in me, I think best systemically when I am feeling in my body like a difference in the top of my head or in my right temple because I associate my right temple with more creative thinking and then the top of my head is when I am using both creativity and judgment and connectivity with my body right um I had that interesting conversation with my therapist the other day about how with my new meds my new medicine regimen that I'm on uh I have started, in my opinion, re-growing or reawakening sleeping nerves. And what that means in my experience is that uh, areas of my body that didn't have very much touch sensitivity, I am now gaining touch sensitivity. And a lot of this land that I'm gaining in terms of control through my nervous system is internal. I suspect this is caused by the fact that my condition causes chronic pain. And when you have a lot of pain and the source of the pain is not fixed, I suspect that the brain starts turning off the pain sensors for those areas because it just, it's useless, right? Yeah, thanks, Josh. We know it hurts. It always hurts. It always has hurt and it always will because modern medical science has not figured out how to make it not hurt. Or modern science has figured out how to make it work, but modern society has decided that only rich people can afford that medication that will fix my condition, right? As an example, because there's a lot of medications that are heavily patented so that's the control of information. This relates to the freedom of information I was talking about earlier. Um, so when the control of information is very strict, only the wealthy have access to information and education. When information is free, everyone can be educated 
and all of society is able to elevate to a new level, which is why freedom of information is so important, and it is the foundation upon which freedom of speech is built on, right? So freedom of speech is definitely important, and what freedom of speech should control is whether or not you um, should face criminal punishment for something that you have said, right? That means the government punishes you. If, for example, you scream fire in an open bar, I think that's the, is that actually illegal or is that just something people say? Like, is it illegal to scream fire in a movie theater? Yeah, I think it's illegal because it causes stampedes. Um... So no, it's a free speech because of the dam it's the danger of provoking violence. It is not protected by the First Amendment. Yes, this is what it is. The danger of provo provoking violence, right? In the society and the better world that we dream of, we do not want violence, which means that speech that provokes violence should be more tightly controlled, right? If we want a more violent world, we will not control provoking, provocative language. If we want a more peaceful world, we will control provocative language. Now, the problem here comes in as what is considered provocative, right? I, for example, am transgender. And a lot of people consider seeing me in public to be provoking to them, right? They don't want to see me. And they don't want to see me out on the street. And they want to pretend in their daily life like trans people don't exist. Or they want to pretend that fat people don't exist. They want to pretend that ugly people don't exist. So anytime somebody is trans or fat or ugly or, um, you know, darker skin toned. Some people also, racists, don't want to see darker skin toned people in public. So they want to control white areas where they can live in their little white people safe space and never see a black person in their life, right? That is the, the racist dream. That is literally the definition of what Nazis did in Hitler. He wanted to create a superior human race. It's the whole reason why eugenics are very tightly controlled because eugenics can very quickly uh, become fucking genocide, right? Like, what you choose to control and what you choose to not control and who you choose to help will influence the society that you live in, right? And that's not just in greater politics. That's also in your local community and in your interpersonal relationships, right? If you have a best friend and you find out that your best friend raped a girl and you help him cover it up, you are making a world where rapists get away with rape, right? When I was in, uh, after college, I had a friend from high school who um, I had a weird, complicated history with. Uh, we made friends because he was Mormon and I was not. I think at that age in middle school, what was I a... Uh, it, no, it was high school, so I wasn't a deist anymore. I was just a, I was just a flat out agnostic or an atheist at that point. So um, anyway, so in middle school I was a deist. I believed in a clockwork God. God created the world, but He abandoned us, and He'll never do anything for us ever again. Uh, then later on in high school, um, I evolved into. I don't have any evidence that he created the world either because all of these Bible thumper people say that the earth is only 6,000 years old and my science class is teaching me that that's not true and that we have a lot of evidence to prove that it's not true, right? Uh, maybe religions should stick to creating moral laws that keep people good people and increase the benefit to society and uh, a little bit less on the information control aspect is my opinion, because religions can actually be very powerful and very positive influences on people's life. Um, when I was in high school, 
I was a part of the Gay Straight Alliance in my school, and there was a local pastor who wanted to, um, so what happened is he, he was black and we had, uh, was it, it was either Martin Luther King Day or like Equality Week where one day of the week was dedicated to each thing, maybe a part of Spirit Week or something, who knows, um, rural America, they had random, poorly organized things of that nature that, did very badly organized social engineering. Um, like D.A.R.E., that was that was a huge flop. It's, it's basically in the same era as D.A.R.E., right? This was the same type of thing, and uh, it was expected to be this similar level of camp. A little bit less camp since the it was high schoolers, but still pretty campy. Most events were pretty campy. So there was this um, reverend who, um, in my hometown, wanted to, so he was invited because I think he had a daughter who went to our school or some relative of his went to our school and they were like, my relative is a, a reverend. He should, he also has done a lot for like racial equality, which I think he had, you know, and that's a fair their thing, you know, um, deficits in one area don't comp, uh, don't, uh, cancel out good things that people have done, right? You should celebrate good things and, uh, disdain bad things. Otherwise people are separated into good and bad. And the only difference between good and bad is, um, whether you like them or not. And, uh, that's not a great way to run a society now, is it? So, um, in any case, like I said, uh, they were proud of their relative because of his work on um, on racial justice. And they wanted him to come and speak at the event. But what happened is, um, it leading up to the event, after the school had approved him and invited him, and he was scheduled to come, People in the community researched him to find out who is this guy who's going to come speak at our school, right? Who is this Who is this dude who's going to speak for Equality Day? Does he really stand for equality? I'm not sure, so I'm going to look into him and find out. And what they found is that, according to their definition of equality, no, he didn't. Because he spent massive amounts of funds from his church to uh, try to pass um, laws that would make gay marriage illegal, right? Transgender stuff was not very in the media at that point in time. It's not as if it didn't happen. Um, you know, like, it's been around forever. And even in the U.S., they were writing newspaper articles about transgender people in the 50s and earlier, right? Uh, what was that one lady? Um, U.S. 50s transgender surgery woman. I think she was like the first person. Yeah, this is it. So... Mm -mm -mm. She went to Denmark and got the surgery done in 1952. And she was American, so she flew out of state to get the surgery, which is something that a lot of trans people do to this day. They go to like you know, Thailand or China or wherever. Um, I know a lot of reputable uh, surgeons live in Thailand and um, I considered it myself just because health insurance sucks and it's cheaper sometimes to go out of state. But when insurance doesn't cover care for trans people um, and they have to go out of out of the country to get that care what that means is that only the wealthy people or the people who are able to travel um because of connections or their job only those people are able to have access to that care which is why it's much better now that um you know trans care is becoming more widely accepted because the more doctors who are trained in trans care the more trans care can just become a part of normal care right and then we, trans people, get to just be people, which 
we like, you know, it's nice being able to walk down the street and not being stared at like you're a freak just because people think that you have bad fashion sense. And, and that's essentially what transphobia is, right? Um, on a gut level, I think it has to do with people's sense of disgust gets triggered, right? So in my body, the top of my head uh, is where I feel it in my body from like meditation and shit and medications as well. Uh, that's where I feel my broad spectrum, open-minded thinking, right? That's how I feel it in my body when I am learning new information and I'm taking that new information and I'm organizing it in all the right places and I'm in a flow state. I'm in the zone, right? Now, lower down, uh, closer to the roof of my mouth where that mates my brain and kind of where the back of the throat is that area closer to the brain stem is where I feel my sense of disgust which makes a lot of sense because that's where the gag reflex is right um and that's what makes you vomit so disgust why would people evolve disgust? Well, people evolved disgust. Why do people feel disgusted with things? Because certain things, if you eat them, uh, are going to kill you. <laughs> right? So disgust is the don't eat that emotion. Right? Um, if you eat shit, you're probably going to get diseases. Some animals eat their own shit, but usually those animals are animals that have like better ability to fight off infection compared to humans so like dogs and cats um don't get viral infections the same way that humans do like cats for example have amazing metabolisms and that is one of the reasons why we tamed cats right because cats um help us to manage parasites and fleas because when parasites and fleas have to um, learn to eat cats because there's more cats than humans. So it makes more sense to hop on a cat. Um, you're less likely to die and you're less likely to uh, get washed down the drain or removed without dying. But you're especially less likely to die. And so, naturally, let's take fleas, right? Fleas um, are highly, uh, theorized and widely understood to be the cause of the Black Plague in Europe. Um, the idea was there was this pope who got really, decided that he hated cats and he also hated women, right? Right? And he would often go, like, maybe, maybe, this is a dream, we don't know for real, because it's way too long ago for that, so this is all theory, and I want you to take it that way. Maybe after the stream, I'll change this to a dream stream, because honestly, when I'm doing these repetitive tasks, that's really where I'm going into. Um, I always start a stream in one location, and then I end it up somewhere else, so, uh, sorry about that. <laughs> anyway, um, so as I was saying... This pope decided that he hated cats and he saw women in the neighborhood who were at home because um, women were like making crafts and stuff and uh, men would normally be the ones working further away maybe as like loggers or whatever. I'm going to ignore that doorbell because I don't know who they are and I don't have anything to say to them. Um, and also I'm busy. Anyway. So, uh, as I was saying, um, cats, the Pope, witch hunts. Yeah. So he saw women feeding, uh, cats. This is my theory, by the way. We have some evidence for this and some of it I'm making up by like drawing lines between evidence. I'll leave it up to you to determine, uh, what that is. Maybe I'll find my YouTube video here. Um, I better stay on top of saving my links, huh? That way I can post these in the YouTube description later. That's not what I was going for. Fine, I'll just click the button like a pleb. Damn. Alright, so, um, what is my 
it's my YouTube history. YouTube. YouTube, YouTube, YouTube. And my history. And then I wanted to ask about the plague or cats. What made the Black Death so deadly? I mean, honestly, several of these are good. But I want plague and cats and witch hunts. That's what I'm looking for specifically. So... This isn't my history. Oh. I clicked the wrong thing. Cats. Witch. Hunt. Okay. How rude. Alright, what if I just remove hunt? Nothing? Cats? Cats and the Black Death. I knew I'd get it eventually. Hello, and what- Alright, so I'm gonna save that for anybody who wants to watch more. And then my dream videos will just be me wandering to random shit in a stream of consciousness and providing you with random articles and stuff from my memory that I have pre-curated to make sure that they are still relevant and have not been overwritten by new data. Um, cool. So, dang, I've really, like, wandered here, haven't I? I can always tell when I've wandered by my tabs because I'll open a new tab and I won't close the old ones. And then I can just sort of follow them in a train all the way everywhere. So, um, what was the core concept of what I was trying to say? Anyone wants to remind me in the chat, you are more than welcome to do so because sometimes I need the, uh, the extra assistance to stay focused. But, um, in the meantime... So I was talking about trans stuff, I was talking about my high school, and I was talking about my high school because I was talking about disgust. That's what it was. We were talking about why humans have disgust. Okay. Yeah, so, um, I believe that a lot of bigotry actually comes from a sense of disgust that is getting applied where it shouldn't be, right? Right? So disgust evolved in order to prevent you from eating things that will make you sick or worse, dead, right? So that's one reason why green eggs and ham, you know, at some point people did not want to eat green eggs and ham uh, or any meat or dairy that has green in it. Why do we have that association? Well, because normally when meat or dairy are green, they are rotten, right? We have learned to associate that with a classification of bad bacteria that we cannot digest, right? Um, another thing is, I think, by percentage, red berries versus uh, blue or purple versus white. I think white berries, by percentage are the most likely to be poisonous and red berries are about 50% poisonous and then um, darker colored berries are 80% safe. So red berries, 50% poisonous. Is that what it is? Something like this, Berry Forager's Guide. Let's make sure that I'm not spreading misinformation because we all hate that. Uh, 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 I don't care about this. Come on, percent. There's no percent here. I've been cheated. I have been lied to. Ah, North America, where I live. How do we know what berries are edible in North America? If it smells bitter... If it has spikes, if it has milky sap, and then if you have any doubt, don't eat it. Just like on plant identification reddits, they have the don't eat it bot. Stay away from white, yellow, and green berries. Uh -huh. So these are the colors that if you eat it, you are not going to have a good time. Red berries are roughly 50% safe, and in general, black 
blue, and aggregated berries like raspberries, blackberries, strawberries. Or no, I don't think that that's what aggregated means, but whatever. Um, are safe, generally. Except for the pokeberry, which is bad. Cool. Cool, my memory is serving me well. I actually remembered that properly. So, yeah. Let's add that to the list of random things that I've Googled today. Um, right. So, disgust. Disgust evolved in this fashion from, like, don't eat that thing. You will get sick, right? Now, with my chronic illness, one of the things that I deal with, and uh, a lot of autistic people have stomach issues, and I suspect that the reason for that is related to how things work with me. So in my body, um, there's this book called Salt, Fat, Acid, Heat. Let's start closing out the ones that we've finished with already. This is an amazing book. I own it. I have studied it. And it is very useful. And another one is Science Lab Cookbook, right? Is that what it is? Where is this one? Come on, buddy. You can do it. Ah, right. The Food Lab. That one. I love this book, too. So, um, right. Both of those are really good science-based stuff on the chemistry of cooking, right? Where science meets the art of cooking, right? A lot of people get a feel for the art of cooking, and they just cook by feel because they've just cooked so much that they start learning all the patterns before science has ever figured out those patterns, right? That is the amazing thing about the human mind is that we are so good at pattern recognition. Um, and machines have not quite caught up to us in many ways, right? That's part of the study of quantum physics and everything. Um, brains are wild, man. So, oh yeah, I guess there's a Netflix thing. I should, I think I've watched a few episodes of that. And it was really good. Um, I loved seeing where all the food came from. And like, she traveled around the world, if I'm remembering it right. And then she talked about like, when she was talking about how people made bacon, then she talked about how they fed the pigs and how the pigs would eat acorn and how everything that they ate would affect the flavor. And, um, you know, I'm a vegetarian and I've been a vegetarian for over 25 years, but I still really enjoy learning about, you know, animal husbandry and like how those, how that operates. Anyway, so the core thing I was talking about disgust and they talk about salt, fat, acid, and heat. And I have found for me is that my sense of disgust, um, and, a, and a little bit about this. I have stomach issues where I feel nauseous all the time for like no reason. And if I force myself to eat, I'll just vomit it back up. My body's like, fuck you. We're not going to put that shit in our mouth. How dare you make me eat this? I refuse. These are not the nutrients that I ordered. And you need to send this back to the kitchen, you piece of shit. Right? That's my nervous system. My nervous system is like that to me all the time. It's If it sounds like an abusive relationship, it is in that specific analogy. But uh, maybe we could see it more of like a really shitty, unorganized government. Um, in any case, yeah, I'm uh, definitely health impoverished there. So my sense of disgust is hair trigger. <laughs> it gets triggered really easily. Um, I think maybe it has something to do with synesthesia to a degree. Um, I have a better handle on it now, but when I was younger, for example, if I would look at roadkill on the road and I would see it rotting and I would see the flies buzzing around it, then this was a fully tactile hallucination where I don't know if they're called hallucinations when they're not visible, but I'm going to call it that because that's the only word I know. And if you know the actual word for it, please feel free to inform me in the comments. I've always loved to learn things. Uh, tactile? 
hallucinations? Is that a thing? Ah, it is a thing. I use the right word. Bam. Make shit up and it just happens to be true because it's logical. Beautiful. That's how logic should work. Alright. Yeah, you're not special for coming up with a unique problem that no one else could come up with. You're special for coming up with a unique solution that everyone can learn really easily. Right? The more broad appeal and the better understood your process is, the more special you are. You're not more special just because you were able to keep your information more exclusive. <sighs> Small rant about society and freedom of information. Anyway, salt, fat, acid, heat. So I found that when I was trying to figure out my stomach problems, the first thing I did is I was like, how to reduce nausea, right? And then they'd be like, here's some stuff you want to do. Drink clear or ice cold drinks. You know what? I do drink mostly ice cold drinks. That does help me a lot. Unless you have sensitive teeth, in which case you're fucked. Um, eat light, bland foods. Uh, you know, that's sometimes okay, but, um, sometimes light, bland foods just taste like sand in my mouth, and I can't eat them. So that one I'm gonna kind of toss to the wayside. Avoid fried, greasy, or sweet foods. Well, I am very sugar sensitive. I usually can only eat a tiny amount of sugar, and I chop that up to my parents being into diet fads and literally throwing out all the sugar in the house growing up. So I, my body just never adapted to dealing with sugar, is my theory. So greasy and fried. Greasy and fried really mean the same thing. It means that there was oil involved, and oil is a fat, right? So they're saying avoid lots of sugar or avoid fat. That actually checks out for me, sort of. So we'll sort this one into the maybe useful, maybe not useful. Eat slower, slowly and eat smaller, more frequent meals. <sighs> when I was younger, I never had enough sensation in my stomach to be able to tell whether or not there was a connection here. However, now that I have changed my medications and I have a lot more sensation on both the inside and the outside of my body, right? My tissue, the nerves are better dispersed in general. Um, oh, phew, I thought I missed my voice acting lesson and I didn't. It's tomorrow. It's just giving me the alert today. Oh, I almost gave myself a heart attack. Okay. Yeah, I have to give myself alarms because it keeps me focused when my ADD is ruining my memory. All right, so eat sm slowly and eat smaller, more frequent meals. So I never felt it in my stomach, but I did notice that I feel it in my throat. If I eat only a small bite at a time, and then I concentrate really hard when I swallow, I don't choke. So this is probably due to my dysphagia more than anything. It does like not my stomach itself, but the dysphagia. Do not mix hot and cold foods. Um, okay, I can see the logic behind that. Um, I usually do mix them, but I try to keep myself balanced between the two, right? So if I have a cold drink, then I want hot food. And if I have cold food, then I want a hot drink, right? So I will typically balance myself in that way rather than just eating tepid food. I hate tepid food. Maybe the reason for that is that I'm more prone to choking because um, it is a well-understood fact among the dysphagia community that if you, eat, uh, if you eat things that are not hot or cold, you're more likely to choke because your throat can't tell that there's food in it. So drink beverages slowly. I do that. I just take tiny sips each time. It's basically barely enough to wet my mouth. And then uh, Corachoon will just sit there and take this giant 20 ounce glass and just chug the whole thing. And I'm like, holy shit, my body does not work that way. I will get a huge stomach ache if I even take a full mouthful of water, right? I have to take tiny sips because if I fill my whole mouth with a drink and then I swallow it all at once, I will vomit. 
right? My body does not like that. And then avoid activity after eating. Well, this one is interesting to me because when I was reading a lot of Asian novels, they often recommend walking after eating to help digestion. And I've also read that doctors tell you to do that. Maybe it depends, you know, um, maybe, maybe it depends because you're not, GERD can often be caused by eating and then laying down, right? Because, um, your digestive system functions most appropriately when your torso is at some type of incline. And in my opinion, that is because your torso and your digestive tract is, is gravity assisted, right? That's why they're always doing these, uh, these space programs. Like they study people in zero gravity to see if it fucks up their digestive system. Uh, because it does fuck up a lot of how our body works because our bodies are very well adapted to gravity, right? So gravity helps with a lot of things, which means that if you, for example, are bedridden for eight or nine years, like I have been, well, <laughs> a lot of stuff is going to stop working well, right? Um, I think, didn't NASA do something where they like paid people to lay in a bed for eight months? Yeah. Dang, guys. I don't qualify, though, because I'm, I'm not healthy by default, right? So they're not going to pay me money. Um, they want a healthy person, and then they want to see how much your health gets ruined. My health is already ruined, so they don't give a shit about me, and they're not going to give me money. Oh, well. Worth a shot. Gotta hustle, you know. Um... <coughs> One sec, go text this person. Uh, on a call. It's technically true. Streaming is a call. It's just a call that gets recorded and then displayed to people after the fact as well. So anyway, um, as I was saying, I was going over nausea, disgust, how disgust relates to bigotry um so for me right some people have allergies right and an allergy might look like if you ever talk to somebody and they're like oh man i have the worst gluten intolerance so that's an intolerance and then uh an intolerance is when you eat something and it causes gut inflammation you're not going to get anaphy anaphylactic shock and die but it is going to make you pretty miserable, right? Lactose intolerance fits into this category. Um, an allergy is like somebody who has a peanut allergy. And if anybody spikes them with peanuts, they will die unless they get a, uh, a shot, right? Unless they can get a, um, what are those shots called? An EpiPen? Unless they can get an EpiPen, they will fucking die, right? My ex-roommate had that. And I... I just, she also had problems with mental health, and I was worried that, you know, she would, like, purposefully eat peanut butter. So even though I love peanut butter, I completely stopped eating peanut butter as long as we lived together, because I didn't want to take that risk. I didn't want to take the risk of keeping peanut butter in the house and somebody not cleaning a knife, because uh, she also was not especially tidy. So I could see her just grabbing a random knife off the counter that was dirty or and like casually wiping it down and then using it and if you have a very sensitive allergy you're gonna fucking die if you do that you have to wash that shit with soap and water you maybe you gotta put it through a dishwasher and just give all of those peanut amino acids or whatever it is people are allergic to give it heat death you know Kill it with fire, nuke it from fucking orbit. It depends on how severe your allergy is, man. So, um, some allergies and intolerances are like that. They're very easy to identify because it's just one thing, right? Now, I have found for me, what matters in my stomach is the balance of fats and acids. Now, I was trying to figure out how the fuck to feed myself as a chronically ill person. And the first per place I thought to look was like, Chinese um, medicinal cuisine, 
right? Because they have this culture of food as medicine. And if you control your food and everything in small amounts, then you just won't get sick in the first place. And some people believe that it can, you know, cure diseases. But the vast majority of people who are more science focused and also into Chinese medicine just acknowledges it as the same thing about like going to the doctor regularly for annual appointments, right? It's all about prevention and not about um, fixing something after it's a problem. That's one of the big differences between uh, Eastern medicine and Western medicine. Eastern medicine has a much better, more consistent focus on prevention, whereas Western medicine... Yeah, we like to play it a little, uh, we like to play a little bit more wild and dirty with our health. Run yourself into the ground and only realize something is wrong after your life is burning around you. Um, which, you know, I can say that my approach to disability has been a very American approach because I kept working until I physically couldn't. I was in college and I was working at a college job. I graduated early because I couldn't keep up with my coursework anymore. I was originally going for a dual degree, uh, BA, BS. I ended up having to just settle for a BA with a science minor because um, I was too sick to keep up with the coursework. And I knew that if I didn't graduate now, maybe I will never graduate, right? One downside is uh, if you get both degrees at once... Um, you can still get government loans at the time, I think. There was this system that I remember. Someone told me, I don't know if whether it was accurate or not, though, but at the time I had the impression that if you got two degrees and you still had no degree and then you got both of them at once, then you would have better financial aid than if you got one degree and then went back to school and got another degree, right? So it's arguable whether or not we want to do that because, like, that model where you can't afford going back to school really keeps education in the hands of the wealthy because only the people who can afford to keep learning can. Whereas the middle class, for example, if college is more important, the middle class will just get the most basic degree that they can get away with and still get a job, which used to be elementary, which used to be no education. Then it was elementary school, and then it was middle school education, and then it was high school education, and then it became uh, maybe like a trade school or a two-year degree thing or certification, and then it evolved into a four-year degree, and then a lot of people felt like they wouldn't be able to find a job unless they went to an eight-year degree because we were all brainwashed as children. Go get a college degree. College is your ticket to uplifting you, your family, your descendants out of poverty. If you do not go to college, you will be poor and your family will be poor and your children will be poor and they will get cancer and they will die and you won't be able to afford to keep them alive, right? So, in my generation, everybody was like, shit, we gotta go to college. It doesn't matter what degree you get. You could get a degree in whatever, right? As long as you get that four-year degree, you can get a better paying office job compared to a shittier uh, lab manual labor job that will keep you and your family poor for generations, right? That is what I was taught from my family who mostly came from manual labor jobs and then my parents were the first generation or the second generation exiting those manual labor jobs, right? So I guess you could say that my family was very new to entering the middle class from a genealogical perspective. Um, bringing it back, we were talking about disgust and fats and acid. So um, when I wanted to figure out how the fuck I'm supposed to feed myself, because... What happened to me is I, I graduated early. I kept working until I absolutely couldn't work anymore. And what that mean is uh, I collapsed at work and nobody caught me. So I just kept working like nothing happened. And that happened more frequently and more frequently until one time I collapsed at work and somebody else was there. 
And then they were like, we need to call an ambulance. And I was like, oh, no, don't call an ambulance. This happens to me all the time. It's normal. And they were like, what the fuck do you mean it's normal? It's not normal to collapse. And I realized that they would probably fire me if I kept collapsing at work, right? Uh, I was inconveniencing everyone. Everyone was panicking. They were worried. They were like, holy shit, it's not normal to collapse at work. And that was the period of time where I realized I can't keep working this job because I keep collapsing. And what that means is I would be walking and then suddenly I would black out and hit the deck, right? That is how I found out that I was sick. <laughs> that just kept happening. And it happened during a time of really high stress, which is actually very common for um, the condition I have, which is called POTS, one of the conditions. The thing is, conditions cluster together, so no one has just one thing. You either have nothing or you have everything, right? And if you have nothing, it's normally not because you have nothing. It's normally because you just never go to the doctor, right? Um, usually there are small things wrong with you that you just don't care about because it doesn't impact you that much. Now, um, for me, I went to the doctor and, uh, I tried to keep working while going to the doctor at first. And I went to the doctor two to four times a week for two years before I got diagnosed. And I think, how long was I doing that and working at the same time? It was for a while. Um, for a while, I was seeing four doctors a week and going to the doctor or, and working um, part-time, not full-time, because I had just graduated college. I hadn't found a full-time job yet. So that's how that went. Like... That was a wild ride, but I did my best. I was a project, I wasn't a project manager. I was a part-timer doing the job of a project manager, but getting paid as a part-timer because it was a small organization with a small budget. That's how these things go. In a, in a small organization, everybody has to wear multiple hats because human resources are really scarce. And human resources are scarce because they can't afford to pay people any money, right? To start any kind of business, you kind of need some sort of resource. If you don't have money, you have to invest a lot of time and effort into it for your human resources. If you have lots of money, you can hire people right away and bam, you're able to get off the ground a lot better as long as you're not a fucking idiot, right? Um, as long as you're not really bad at your job you're able to delegate tasks better, right? This is kind of the work smarter, not harder philosophy. So when I got sick, I started having way more nausea than I ever had in my life before. And I started having lots of health problems and I didn't know what the fuck to do about that. And doctors were fucking useless most of the time, right? So doctors as a profession... There are multiple types of doctors. Most people do not understand that there are multiple hierarchies of doctors, right? They understand that there are specialists, but they don't understand that within one job position, there are the doctors that are involved in ongoing science, research, and education. And then there are the doctors who are not involved in ongoing science, research, and education. Doctors who are still involved in ongoing science, research, and education generally are willing to deal with people who have complicated medical issues, right? Because they are people who are still thriving in their need to learn, right? They graduated college and they got their medical degree, but they didn't get that medical degree just to make money, right? They got that med or they didn't get that medical degree just to help people either. They got that medical degree because they love a challenge, right? These are the doctors you want when you get sick. You want a doctor who loves a challenge. You want an ambitious doctor. You want an, a doctor who's still doing research, who is actively involved, who like maybe uh, works part-time at a clinic and part-time at, at a college teaching med students, right? If your doctor is asking you if it's okay that, that a student comes in and, like, views whatever they're doing for you that day, 
I always say yes, um, as long as I comfortably can, right? The reason for that is because those doctors are involved in actively teaching the next generation and they are involved in, and they aren't complacent. They don't believe they know everything. They believe that there's always more to learn and they are always in search of improving themselves and being better at their jobs, which is to be a doctor, which is to keep you alive, which is what you want, right? Ideally, all medical professions would require people to continuously be educating themselves, right? Now, um, to some degree they do. Maybe that's like the point of like certifications that need to get renewed on a regular basis. If you get a certification once and then you never have to renew it again, that's not that useful, right? The purpose of a certification that you get once and never again is a class barrier, right? Because in, if education is expensive and you go once and then never again, then only the rich people will do it or only the people with free time will do it. If it's not a wealth thing, it'll be a time thing. And uh, it's, it's not great, right? So if instead you have certifications that need to be renewed frequently, that is going to keep your professional your profession at a um at a better level right like food service industry if you have a, a license to deal with food you have to test routinely and upgrade your license over and over again and we do that so that the food that we buy in public remains safe because if uneducated people are handling our food then diseases are going to spread right that's why people are so touchy um, and like food service industry workers will always have stories. It, Reddit is a great place to find out about subcultures. I follow several um, like food industry subreddits for people who work in the food industry. I don't work in the food industry, but I follow those subreddits so that I can understand the culture of the people who do, right? So in the food industry, like, depending on which Reddit you are, because even there, you'll have some Reddits that are, like, more about fine dining chefs, and then some Reddits that are more about, like, you know, a bed and breakfast or uh, Denny's chefs, right? Now, the people who are at the Denny's chefs who feed more people, right, they are the people who are working the hardest. They feed the most people with the least time. They are stressed out of their mind. Apparently, there's lots of drugs involved in kitchens. Uh, but also, you know, one nice thing about kitchens is typically they will hire people without any kind of background check, right? So if you have any kind of record um, that prevents you from getting hired normally, you can generally get hired in a kitchen, right? They're not going to be judgmental about that kind of thing. They're very open-minded and very accepting of people from walks of life, you know? Um, and that can have mixed bag, like some restaurants you might work in. And, uh, there was a local restaurant where apparently the owners were like involved in the Coke business. And I have had my life threatened just because I said that. Um, so I guess people are really touchy about that kind of thing. I guess that's the connection of like drugs and organized crime and Anyway, um, I didn't really care about the Coke business so much, but I did care when they uh, took a hit out on a local that I knew. So, interesting look into the seedy underbelly of the, um, you know, how, how organized crime operates at a small level. Sometimes I like organize, like thinking about systems and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, again, my information about this restaurant being involved in the coke dip business, it's not really useful for the purpose of criminal justice, right? Um, and I think that's why people are so touchy about it, because, um, it is something I heard from someone. And rumors 
actually can be a really useful way to get information, but they're not a useful way to curate information, right? So after you receive a, a rumor, you have to curate it and decide how, um, how accurate it is, right? So the person I knew who had a hit called out on them, their evidence was, you know, decent. Um, I didn't know them super well, so I wouldn't say the evidence was like rock solid. Um, I know that they were in a time of stress and a lot was going on in their life. And sometimes small problems look a lot bigger when you don't have enough resources to handle them, right? Um, so, yeah. Anyway, uh, as I ramble, I very quickly lose track of old stories. For example, I did not tell you guys the story about my childhood friend who turned out to be a rapist. And then I had to tell him that he had raped somebody. And then I had to counsel him on how he could take accountability for his actions going forward. He listened to me and he made good decisions. And then he moved away. And then his accomplice and the sexual abuse uh, like, tried to convince him that no sexual abuse took place and that it was the victim's fault. And I think psychologically, he had already accepted that he had done something wrong because I talked him through it and I pointed out what was wrong and how he should have known better, right? Um, drugs or not drugs, but alcohol was involved with a new sexual partner, which is not a very good idea, right? If you are having sex with somebody for the first time, generally you want to be sober to make sure that they actually want to have sex with you, right? Um, relationships happen in stages and anytime you make a big jump in intimacy, um, there it's riskier. It's better to take tiny steps towards being closer because people are less easily startled that way. They're not going to be uh, falling into issues from their insecure attachment style. Um, so if you don't know about psychology, uh, PSY, ecology, attachment styles, this is an interesting psychological theory. Um, so the psychological attachment styles are like avoidant attachment style. So by stereotype, avoidant attachment style is going to be the people who are like, um, you know, that stereotype about that dude who goes out and fucks everything and he's really gorgeous, but he won't settle down and get married. And anytime a girlfriend gets too close to him, he breaks up with them. And there's also the same stereotype for women, right? The stereotype for women would be like a woman who goes and hangs out at bars and like sleeps around with a lot of people. And then like every relationship she has ends in drama and she ends up breaking up with somebody um, or they break up with her, right? So this is like not, there are gendered aspects to how we perceive these stereotypes, but there is a base non-gendered stereotype from which the gendered aspects branch off, right? This is that stereotype. An avoidant attachment is somebody with commitment issues or somebody who just doesn't like being around people or doesn't like being around large groups. Secure attachments are generally the people who are, they're, they're pretty cool. They're not very anxious. They like being around people, but they don't need to be around people. They're, they're pretty okay with their spot in life. They, uh, they aren't at a huge deficit and they aren't at a huge, um, what's the opposite of a deficit again? Surplus. Yeah. They do not have a surplus of social pressure and they do not have a deficit of social um, interaction. Ambivalent. This must be depression. I haven't heard of this one before. Uh, na, 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 na. Ambivalent. 
anxious and unconfident about their mother's res- Okay, so these are the babies who have been neglected. Okay, cool. So, in response to neglect, people get ambivalent attachment styles, which is like... Ah. Mothers were observed to lack the fine sense of timing in responding to an infant's needs. <laughs> that is such a polite way of saying that. I kind of approve. But it is true, because it is, you know... um assuming a mother has compassion for her child or a father has compassion for his child or a, a serent has compassion for their child. Or, no, wait, serent is aunt and uncle. Ren. Mother, father, Renner. That's what it was. I'm trying to remember all of these gender neutral terms. I'm still, still figuring it out. You don't get to use them that often, so it doesn't get into the muscle memory. Um, so Renner is... Father, mother, Renner. And then mom, dad, Ren. And then aunt, uncle, Sarent. And then niece, nephew, Nibbling. Or Niblet. Um, or Pibbling. Although some people use Pibbling for like aunt and uncle. But I disapprove of that because it doesn't sound right. It sounds hierarchically... It sounds diminutive. And usually we use diminutive for, like, younger people. Um, in language, that is. Right? Like, in Chinese, there's Zhao, which means small or cute. Right? And it's used for children and also for short people and cute people. Um, in Japanese, they use, like, Chan and Kun. And Chan has an essence of cuteness, which is its main feature. But it also is more likely used for young feminine people. Not men, young feminine people. And then kun is used for young masculine people. Not men, or... Yeah, chan is not only used for girls or women. And kun is not only used for boys and men. It is actually denoting, like, tomboys will use kun. And, like, very feminine boys would use chan, right? So, um, and both of those have an association with both age and size, right? So that is a pattern that I personally have noticed across multiple languages. Um, I haven't studied in depth all of them, but I have studied a fair amount of languages on a surface level, right? Um, my, uh, my anchor is, um, anchor slash nesting partner slash whatever other polyamorous word you want to use for a long-term relationship um, that you also live with and share finances with. Um, so anyway, my anchor is a native Ukrainian. Um, and he has citizenship with the U.S., but he's originally from Ukraine and came over here when he was you know, in his uh, middle school years, early teens, like 13 or something. So I studied a bit of Russian um, because that was his main language at the time. Or not his main language, but that's his family's main language, right? His, his mother is here and his stepfather, and uh, they speak primarily in Russian. So in Russian... I mostly studied the word for cat, but cat has like 11 different forms based on the type of cat it is, like Russian words for cat. Like there is an image here. Uh, this one, this is my favorite one. Yeah, I love this one. Um, I hope they gave us a link to the original artist because I really like I better save this attachment styles. I've moved on from that already. What a wild ride my dream streams are going to be. Let's actually find the original artist. So search for this image. Because I'm pretty sure they were on DeviantArt or something, weren't they? So let's find the image source. Oh! <gasps> That is a wonderful button. 
So it's on the wiki how. But I don't think that's it. This is definitely an artist made this, okay? I remember because I followed them on some page and that's how I saw this. But all of these places are just like sharing it and not sharing who the frick made this art. So is there like a watermark somewhere? No. See, this is why it's important to watermark your art. I, I don't do that. And because I don't do that, I'm sure people will like find my art somewhere and then it will be shared and it'll never be, they'll never be able to find my art page. Is this going to have a link to the artist? No. What the heck is that? That. Tolstoy. Sounds too much like Tolstoy to me. I don't like Tolstoy's writing. I am not a fan. If you like Tolstoy, I'm sorry um, for your bad taste. Or maybe you like one of the ones I didn't read. That's also possible. You know, uh, this picture has been very, very successfully pirated. I cannot find the artist in any kind of short, uh, short duration of time. So that's fucking life. We'll move on, I guess. I'll just share the wiki page. Whatever. Alright, so anyway, I was talking about how in languages, diminutive tends to be associated with youth and size, right? So, um, yeah. So there's, if you can speak uh, Cyrillic or read Cyrillic alphabet, this is ko sh -ka. This is the sh, sh sound. Koshka, um, and then a single she-cat, right? Kot, and that's a single male cat. So they use A for feminine more, more often. Um, I think that has to do with the, the gendered group categories of their grammar. Um, I believe that they have masculine, feminine, plural. I don't know if they have a separate neuter, separate from plural or not, though. Um, Koshushka, Kotnik. So, Koshushka, Koshush, I think the E is pronounced ye, kind of. Koshushka, Koshushka. I'm going to get made fun of so much by Korachun later. He's going to be like, your pronunciation is shit and you should feel like shit, you uncultured swine. But he means it in all, all, all in good fun. We just talk to each other like that sometimes. Um, but we both know that it's not serious, so it's all good. Uh, right, so... Koshki. Kosh. Koshesh. Kosheshki? Kosheshki. All the Russian first language people sitting here are going to be laughing at me how I'm failing to pronounce all of these words because it's been eight, nine years since I studied. Kuchonok? Kuchata? I didn't know Kuchata. I only knew Kuchara. Kuchara. Yeah. Anyway, um, as you can see, there's kind of like this pattern, right? Like more vowel noises for the baby ones, like kot, yonok, y. They added the y sound compared to the um, older cats. And the groups of cats all have this e sound, which has to do with the grammar. I think E is what they stick on things in a more complicated way than that to make it plural. Um, kind of like platypi, octopi, um, 
testi, you know, plural, I sound, probably originates from Latin or whatever base language Latin shares with that. I think it was like proto, proto European, proto Indo European, something like that. Language. Let's look that up. Proto. So, anyway, that's what I was pointing out about the diminutive. So, let's get back on topic here. Salt, fat, acid, heat. Dang, I'm really struggling to keep on task to this. So, sense of disgust. So, for me, um, when I was trying to figure out how to eat, I was figuring out food. And I was like, all of my nutritionists are telling me to just pay attention and write down what I eat and then figure out what makes me sick. Now, that is a really good thing to teach somebody because that is the scientific process. Right? The scientific process, you ask a question about something that you observe. My stomach is a piece of dysfunctional shit. Why? What am I eating that is making it so upset? Doing a background research on what is already known about the topic. I went to see a bunch of doctors, nutritional doctors, and I was like, what is wrong with me? Fix it. And they were like, oh man, wow, that is a flaming hot mess for sure. Whoa, um, damn, how do you live like that? Oh, geez. Um, I don't even know where to start, right? And this stage is what separates the good doctors from, well, the good doctors for chronically ill patients, right? Uh, a doctor who isn't involved in active research is going to be just fine for healthy people. But for sick people, no. For sick people, you need somebody involved in research, right? Um, for tiny, minor aches and pains... You know, maybe uh, you've got an impacted zit that just needs to be removed. That's really easy. You see it with your eyeballs. You could have told them that. You could have cut it out yourself at home, but then you wouldn't have access to painkillers, am I right? And it would probably scar really ugly, and then if you didn't disinfect things properly, you might get an infection. So you go to the doctor, but you already know what needs to be done. You need to cut the thing out and then sew it back up so it heals properly, Right? Those kinds of problems, very easy to diagnose. And if you have that kind of problem, well, it doesn't take that much skill to diagnose that problem. Doctors know exactly what to do with you. They send you to a dermatologist, or they send you to somebody to set your broken bone, or they send you to, like, um, whatchamacallit. Ah, <sighs> words dermatologist, skin, ER. If it's serious, they'll send you to the ER, right? They'll be like, this is above my pay grade. You're bleeding out all over the goddamn floor. You need an ambulance, right? I, I am not paid enough to deal with, with this level of panic, right? So um, a lot of doctors, once you reach this stage, uh, the answer you get is that the amount of background research that that doctor already has on your commission condition, which if you have a rare condition, the average doctor's background re research on your condition is shit. They went to med school. They maybe, maybe your condition was never mentioned throughout all of med school. Maybe the class of, uh, conditions that yours belongs to, um, for example, POTS is under the class or the larger group of conditions known as dysautonomia or disorders of the autonomic nervous system, aka everything your brainstem is supposed to do. That's right, brainstem, I'm calling you out. Being bad at your job. Um, so anyway, uh, as I was talking about doctors... Maybe the doctor did hear about dysautonomia, but they didn't hear about POTS. But they only heard about dysautonomia one time in one PowerPoint during a two-week 
a section of their course that was dedicated specifically to weird shit that you will probably never encounter. Doctors have this language they use, which is horse or a zebra, and they always teach doctors Occam's razor. That's all horse and zebra is, right? Occam's razor is always assume that the easiest solution is the real solution, right? Uh, the problem is when you apply that too aggressively, right? So Occam's razor works when you have a lot of information. And in the modern medical society, often we do as long as you can pay for your labs, right? They charge me $200 every time I get a lab. You know how many labs I have to do for my health? So many labs. And I have to do less now, but it's not because I'm less sick. It's because I already have the data from the previous labs and getting new labs isn't going to give me any new information. I've had every single part of my body scanned and I have actually asked for their records so that one day I can make a really neat collage out of all my x-rays. But that's for another day. So my point is, um, doctors most likely when you have a condition that they don't deal with often, they have no fucking clue what to do with you when you come in, right? That is what happened to me for two years. On average, it takes people seven years to get diagnosed with POTS. How long average diagnosed POTS, right? Five years and 11 months. So it has reduced recently. My knowledge was out of date. So the diagnostic delay for POTS is five years and 11 months only 25% of patients are diagnosed within the first year of symptoms. 50% traveled more than 100 miles from home to receive POTS-related medical care, right? This is what it means to have a disease or a condition or a syndrome that is not well understood. Uh, now, the thing about POTS is that it actually is well understood. We have more than 30 years of research specifically on POTS. But the problem is so few people were getting diagnosed with POTS that we were never able to uh, disperse knowledge about how this condition functions, right? And uh, for anybody who doesn't know, there's a difference between disease, condition, and syndrome, right? So a disease is when whatever is happening to you is caused by um, a specific thing, right? I usually think of disease as something that is caused by a virus or a bacteria, something outside of yourself that is not you. But I'm not sure how accurate that is in how the word actually gets used. This might be a connotation versus denotation thing. A uh, connotation is how the word is actually used in practice and denotation is the word as it is officially recognized to be used in the dictionary, right? Um, so I'm, I'm not sure about the delineation there. I'd have to do more research. But anyway, as I said, it took me two years of going to the doctor two to four times every week for two years straight without missing a, like a single week. I never had a break for those two years. Um, so most people cannot afford to do that, right? Most people cannot afford to go to the doctor two to four times every week. And each doctor appointment takes between half an hour if you just go in for a 15-minute appointment and then you leave, and an hour if they're very busy, because sometimes you have to wait way longer than you're getting seen, right? Um, and then, on top of that, you... Uh, medical stuff... Time... What was it talking about? Two years, yeah. So money, right? I had the benefit that I had... Um, I had a partner to take care of me. Not everybody has somebody to take care of them, right? Not everybody has a lover. Not everybody has a best friend who's willing to financially support them and let you just live in their 
spare room or closet or crash on their couch for an indeterminate amount of time, right? Not everybody has family that is willing to do that for them. Um, and some people do have family that are willing to do that for them, but it's not worth it for the amount of abuse that that family will inflict upon them during their time together, right? Um, so it's really just a matter, everybody's circumstances are different. And because this is a condition that is not very well known in both the personal community and the, and the medical community, although with COVID it's get, getting more traction because a lot of long COVID symptoms are very similar to POTS symptoms and very similar to a, a different condition, which is um, known as, let me copy this really quick. Since I'm moving on. All right. So what is that? It's not called CFE anymore. It's called ME, which stands for some word that I can never remember. Uh, chronic fatigue. So they changed the name. And I think they changed the name so that people would take it more seriously. Um, because it is a real, real disease but, or a real condition, but, uh, a lot of people just make this out to be, like, a Munchausen syndrome thing. Munchausen syndrome. And, and that is, you know, that is a real thing. Um, my family was deeply affected by this syndrome, for example, but I don't think it was necessarily Munchausen so much as it was somebody trying to well, I guess that is the definition of Munchausen, isn't it? Somebody is trying to get some type of material benefit by um, being sick, right? And I don't think it's always done on purpose. Sometimes what happens is somebody is very unhappy and they need help, maybe mentally or physically or both, and no one is listening to them. And... So they make it out to be more dramatic than it is because they perceive that other people are not giving an appropriate response to the level of distress that they are in, right? So Munchausen syndrome is really just a diagnosis that you're being overly dramatic, <laughs> right? But it's overly dramatic in a very specific context that has to do with medical science. Right? Um, really just seems like an extensive hypochondriac. Like some people who are hypochondriac have anxiety and they deal with that anxiety by... Um, they feel that if they are sick, then someone can cure them. And if someone can cure them, then they will no longer suffer. So people who have extreme anxiety and are also hypochondriacs, they process their anxiety by turning their anxiety into a problem that they know can be solved, right? And psychologically, that's better for them because then they don't have to deal with the fact that they don't know what's wrong, right? If they become confident that this is a problem with this one specific thing, then they know that there's a solution if someone will just listen to them, right? Um, the difference is that there, it becomes a syndrome when the person is not willing to listen to the evidence that something else is wrong. And normally this happens, in my opinion, because people had told them that it's all in your head, nothing is wrong with you. When there is something wrong, they just don't know what it is, right? They're trying to get help any way they can, even if people, they think that if more attention is on them, someone is going to notice what's really going on and tell them, right? Only sometimes people's anxiety is so big and so burning and so uncontrollable that they just can't accept the new information and anyone telling them that their information is wrong and that there is a real solution, they internalize that 
as being told that their problem doesn't exist, which is not true, right? Um, for example, I saw a neurologist who, when I went to the doctor, uh, he tried to diagnose me with a conversion disorder. Now, a conversion disorder is a person who has any type of condition that cannot be explained with medical evaluation. That doesn't actually tell you what it is, though, right? Because what it actually is, a conversion disorder, is the idea that if we cannot explain what is wrong with you physically... We reject the idea that something is physically going on with you that we can't detect with the tools we've used so far. When you diagnose with someone with a conversion disorder, what you are saying is that there is no possible physical explanation for why this is happening to you, except that your brain is mentally ill and it is giving you the illusion that something is wrong with your body when it isn't, right? So an interesting his thing about the history of conversion disorder, there's this book I studied in college called The Yellow Wallpaper. The Yellow Wallpaper, oh, hey, it's available for free online. You can read it. I don't know if you'd want to. Uh, but if you do want to, you can. But uh, it's really famous, so if you don't want to read it, you can probably find out anything that you would ever want to know about it um, without having to actually read it and save yourself the time. Because it wasn't well... Like, I was not super impressed with the execution of the ideas it was trying to display. What is impressive about the yellow wallpaper is not the execution of the ideas it's trying to display. What's impressive about the yellow wallpaper is the content that it was trying to display during a time when women were being called hysterical, right? There was a diagnosis of feminine hysteria. Feminine hysteria. Um, I'll pull up the Wikipedia page on that. Wikipedia, there is a something to be said for don't just trust everything you read on Wikipedia. But it is true that if you ever find something on Wikipedia that you want to double check, you can just click and then find out exactly where the source is coming from. So I personally use Wikipedia in order to find things to add to bibliographies. After I ensure that the source material is good, right? So if I'm going to be telling you about something and I want you to do your own research, I'm going to quote Wikipedia. Why? Because you can do your own research by looking here, and then if you decide that all of these people over here are full of shit, then maybe you decide that my information was flawed, right? Um, and if you instead find that they're all from reputable sources, then maybe you'll be like, oh, there's something to that, you know? So anyway, feminine hysteria is basically... A thing that happened when uh, it was categorized as a disease, but the symptoms were literally just a woman having a libido and a normal functioning body. Because there was this mistaken idea that women were all Virgin Marys and they were meant to be pure and sexless and just lie back and think of e England. So if they became too uppity during sex then men would accuse them of having female hysteria. Or if they were, like, experiencing any symptoms of, like, PMS, right? Any mood symptoms that are caused by estrogen fluctuations, those all got shoved into female hysteria because men were considered to be the default. So the way a man works is how a healthy woman should also work. Even though the hormones of testosterone and estrogen affect people differently. 
and they affect everything from how your body regulates temperature to how your body puts fat into your body. It, it controls so many things. So honestly, the idea that two people from two entirely different hormone profiles would act the same when they're healthy is irrational. But at the time, humans had not re yet reached that level. Well, I say humans. Western medicine, right? Just because this problem occurred in Western medicine doesn't mean that it occurred everywhere. And I don't want to um, exclude any pockets of societies that uh, were not this shitty in this specific way, right? Unfortunately, sexism is fairly well spread out in the world. So um, you'll find a lot of sexist stuff from all over the globe. Um, I, I, there's very few places where you won't find some sort of sexist bullshit. So, um, anyway, historically, like the idea is that as we progress into the future, we become less ignorant and as a species, we become kinder to each other and to the world that we live in, right? That's, that's the end goal of being a person instead of being a monster, right? Um, so in any case, this is actually how sex toys were invented. Fun fact, uh, doctors were actually, um, masturbating women, like with their hands, fingering women to cure them of feminine hysteria. And, uh, they got tired. <laughs> they were like, why isn't this, why isn't this patient? orgasming oh my god this is so much work uh we're just gonna like invent a machine to do it for us and that's literally how it how vibrators were invented you would think sex toys they should be invented because somebody just you know maybe somebody was lonely and didn't have a partner and or or maybe there was an aromantic who was like man i'm horny as fuck but this romance biz is bullshit. I'm going to invent a sex toy so that I don't have to fuck anybody and I also won't be really annoyed from having a high libido all the time. But no, actually, they got invented because people thought that women having libidos was against the order of, of nature and the providence of God. And uh, <laughs> they, they started giving doctors the job of sexually satisfying people's wives because the husbands weren't doing it. <laughs> uh, okay, anyway, that aside, fun, fun little history fact. Um, fun little fact. Yeah, if, if you are interested at all in um, gender studies, uh, Stephanie Kuntz. Stephanie Kuntz. Yes, so I studied under Stephanie Kuntz in college. She's awesome. She basically invented the uh, field of history and family studies in the U.S. specifically. Um, before then, the studies were not geared in that direction. So um, all, of, all of her books are really good. I've read most of them and we studied them in school and she also didn't make us pay for them. She wrote the books and so she just gave us like the portion of the book that we needed for our study. So that was cool. She was like curating which part of the book was the most um, valuable for us for whatever she was trying to teach us. And uh, she was definitely one of my favorite um, college professors and she was really, really great. Um, she once told me that I'd be an excellent fit for grad school, but unfortunately I'm too poor for that. But, uh, you know, it was a nice compliment. <laughs> anyway, um, fat and acid, um, discussed. So like I said, I was like going on this journey, trying to figure out how the fuck not to die. Right. You know, cause I had been misdiagnosed as terminally ill several times. And that is not a fun place to be. Um, actually, the entire reason why I started getting into polyamory is because, one, I already knew about polyamory, right? I knew about it because I'm gay. And when you're gay, uh, you are connected with 
a lot of sexual minorities, right? You know more about BDSM than other people. You know more about uh, safe sex than other people. You know more, well, unless you're on Grinder, I guess. Um, <laughs> sorry, not Sinder. Sorry, people on Grinder, get your shit together and put a glove on. Uh, <laughs> use some prep or whatever, man. Anyway, uh, so by and large, sex education is usually higher among sexual minorities because nobody knows about us and we know that we have to do our own research. Otherwise, a lot of stuff will get missed, right? So, um, and you start looking because everybody else is a certain way and you're not that way. And you're like, what the fuck is wrong with me? Am I a freak? You know, um, that's how I started at least. And luckily with the internet, you can do that, right? Back in the day when there was no internet, you had to go to the library. And if you didn't go to the library, you just considered yourself a freak your whole life until you died. And uh, that sucks. And I'm really glad that the information age has made it less likely for that to happen to people, right? It's more likely for people to be able to find out how they work. And that helps you communicate with other people better too, right? Um, I'm about to go off on a tangent and I'm catching myself this time. So anyway, um, I was trying to figure out how the heck I would eat, right? I was, I was um, struggling with weakness. I didn't feel like I was getting enough energy from my food. Um, I was barely eating because I... I was bedridden. I had no work. I did not know how I could get a caregiver. I had several times called my insurance and asked them if they had any programs to help disabled adults get some kind of in-home care. And they basically just told me to go fuck myself several times in a row, right? They're like, we don't have anything like that. If you're not rich, you don't get a caregiver. Fuck you privatization of health insurance people that's uh that's why it sucks right <laughs> they just decide they don't want to pay for it i'm paying into my medical insurance all the goddamn time and then when i need a caregiver because i am disabled and i have been paying into that medical insurance for years i'm not allowed to get one and i have to sit there and what happened to me is that when i was at my sickest i laid in bed and I couldn't even lift my head from the pillow. What that meant is that I could not drink any water. Because I couldn't lift a glass. It was too heavy. But even if it was in a paper cup, I didn't have the motor function to bring that paper cup to my mouth without spilling it. And I couldn't sit up to drink without choking. So I had to basically just sit in bed and lay there reading. I spent all my time reading because... It was the only way to cope with the immense discomfort and suffering I was in, right? Because I was in constant pain and I was always um, uncomfortable and I couldn't eat because I was always nauseous. And to be honest, life is still sometimes like that. It's just when it was at its worst, it was literally all the time. I literally couldn't lift my head from my pillow for six months, which is pretty high on the debilitating illness scale, I would say. Right? Being bedridden uh, is like the most sick anyone can ever get without being literally in the process of rapidly dying. Right? Um, I was basically, if you've ever seen Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, like the old movie, if you saw how he had his four grandparents that were all lying in bed, just laying there, and he had to t he and his mom were taking care of all of them and feeding them and bringing them food and changing their clothes that was me uh except like i didn't have other people laying there with me right i guess before health insurance people just all the old people just got laid together in a room and died together i guess <laughs> like that seems what that movie was communicating to me i don't know but, uh, you know, interesting times, medical stuff, it is. So, when I was sick, 
the way that I would manage it, and I'm saying this because I think a lot of people think if you're that sick, you should be in a hospital. But in the U.S., only rich people can afford to just be in the hospital forever, right? If you are terminally ill and you are poor, you can go home and die. And maybe they'll give you some painkillers unless the war on drugs made it so that they won't give you any, which happens. And it has happened to a friend of mine quite recently, actually. Um, although she's not terminally ill, but she has a very severe pain related illness that causes nerve pain constantly. And she had drugs to control it and they just took them away because uh, her doctor retired and the new one didn't want to prescribe it. So that's how people fall through the medical cracks in the real world, right? Um, and it sucks, you know, it, it really does suck. Um, but, you know, that is the way that life is until we do something and we change it because the world is not going to get better it's on, on its own you know on its own the world gets worse very rapidly um and i think we can see that in the day and i think that humanity is evolving as a species and we're starting to be more conscientious because we can see that we can see that it is not a simple issue of good and evil it is really an issue that if you want the world to be a better place, you have to do something about it. Because if all of us decide it's somebody else's problem, then no one will do it and it will never change. And the more of us get on board to crafting the world in the shape that we want it, into a kinder world, a better world, a world where I don't have to hear about my friend um, texting me and losing contact with me because she's in so much pain that she doesn't even have the energy to text anymore. And so she gets progressively more isolated because she has to spend all her energy just managing her pain to the point where she doesn't have the energy to maintain friendships anymore, right? And that's not her fault. Um, she's actually fairly extroverted. A more introverted person would have lost contact a long time ago. And I want to live in a world where somebody who is sick can get help, right? And you don't have to worry about whether, uh, for example, somebody who's poor Maybe there is a treatment for their medication, but the insurance will not give them the life-saving treatment that they need. And the insurance is quite sneaky. See, they won't tell you, fuck you, go die. They don't use those words. They do tell you that, but they don't tell you those, they don't tell you that in those words, right? What happens is they tell you, oh, you know, we can't give you that med because you need pre-authorization for it. So they won't give you the med unless you get pre-authorization, which usually means you need some kind of doctor's note. So you have to find some doctor that is willing to treat you, right? Now, let's say, like me, you have an un... Uh, at that age, I'm diagnosed now. When you're diagnosed, you are treated so much better by doctors. If you're diagnosed with a common disease, you are treated worlds better by doctors. If you're diagnosed with a rare disease, a lot of doctors will treat you like you're a faker because they don't know about your disease and they don't want to admit that there's more that they could learn. They think they know everything. They live in their little bubble. They treat the same 10 illnesses with the same 10 medications that they mix and match in different combinations to get different effects. And they do know those very well. The medications that they use every day, they know really well. Um, in a more corrupt area, they're taking bribes from medical companies to adopt specific medications, or maybe the clinic has a contract with a pharmaceutical company to supply them with those medications, and then they will give bonuses to doctors who get more patients using those meds, right? That gets some fucked up shit. That is how drugs get overprescribed to people who don't need them right? 
And the reason it works this way is because a doctor just wants their job to be simple, right? And that's that's really all anybody wants. They want to feel confident that they are in control of their job and they know exactly what to do in any situation. We all want to feel like we are prepared for the world. And if we have any sense of pride, then we take pride in our work. And in any labor that we do, we know is the footprint that we are going to leave on this earth when we die, even if it's tiny little butterfly effects, right? You know, um, if you have a lot of pride, then you care about stuff like that. And pride isn't inherently bad. But in excess, it becomes hubris, right? Almost every Greek play is about the evils of hubris. Because when you think you know everything, you stop learning. And when you stop learning, one day the world is going to move on without you. And you'll be left looking around, wondering why no one understands you. And to be fair, geniuses, uh, or not geniuses, but people who pursue education with greater aggressiveness than other people, right? Uh, autistics are often in this group because we have very strong special interests often. Not all of us, but it's, you know, it's common enough that it has become absorbed into the uh, great amalgamous blob that is autistic culture. If you look, you'll see autistic people posting about how much they love tassels or how much they love trains or how much they love any random super specific thing that dominant society, all allistic society thinks that's a bit weird. Why are you so into that specific thing? Can't you just be into one of these brand name hobbies that everybody has? Why do you have to be so passionate about your weird off-brand hobby? You know, like, um, and then if you're a poor person, you'll be like, because I can't afford the brand name medication. I can only afford the off-brand medication. And I know that maybe they're cutting it with other shit or maybe they're filtering filtration process is not as precise but you know what it's good enough and it's all that I can afford so I'm taking it because it's better than nothing you know um anyway getting off topic there getting all inspirational be the change you want to see in the world bro yeah I am like that but that's because I watched a lot of anime growing up and read a lot of manga and uh you know shonen is like that which brings me back to my long rambling discussion about uh, genres. But we're going to go back to acids and fats for now. So I was talking about disability and how I was trying to find out how to eat. So I would Google things like this. I'd be like, how to feed someone with nausea. And they'd be like, I don't know, eat dry foods. For me, I get nauseous when food is too wet, but I also get nauseous when food is too dry. So this advice didn't really help me very much, right? Or I'd be like, book on how to feed sick people. Oh, so this is new. I never found this when I was looking. How to feed this? Wait. Oh, this is from 2012. Is this very good? But there's no Kindle. There's only paperback. I don't know if it's good. There's no reviews. What if it's shit? Oh man, this speaks to me though. Mm -hmm. No special instructions. Uh huh. I'll consider it. I'm going to do more research on this book. Maybe that's good. But I didn't find that book when I looked before. And I looked for years. So... Convalescent is a word I learned because that is the word that we used to use in English to talk about people like me in the early 1900s, right? So when I was looking, convalescent cooking, convalescent cooking. So I found this book that was like, an open source book. It was so old 
that it, it had just become open source, right? And, uh, yeah, it was about the 18 and 1900s. And it was all about convalescent cooking, you know? Back in those old movies where somebody moved to another uh, location because the air was better or something and the doctor told them so or whatever, right? Um, and then they'd just have all these people in these rooms in the hospital waiting to die or whatever. I guess the hospitals, they didn't want to fund them. So instead of continuing down that line of research, we decided to just kick them out onto the streets. <laughs> Uh, it's not funny, but I laugh because if you don't, you cry, right? Um, so anyway, all I could find on how to feed people when you're sick, right? The only thing I could find when I was looking was just like shit that was, was dang, like 40, 60 years old. This is stuff that was, like, old already when my parents were born. So I was like, dang, why can I find something? I can't find anything modern. Like, even this, I'm like, there's no Kindle. There's no reviews. I don't know whether this dude is actually legit or if he's secretly a fraud that, like, faked his doctorate. Or maybe he's one of those people that went through med school and then, like, got into weird conspiracy theories. So he technically never got his, like, license revoked. But no one takes him seriously in his field. Right? You know? Eh? Eh. That's the thing. When you want to judge somebody, you need to judge them based off of the group they're in. Right? So if you want to judge how good a doctor is, you need to decide, like, how good do other doctors think they are, right? And you do that with ongoing education and research, right? Because those are the people who are still publishing shit. Those are like the superstars of the medical and science fields, right? They're the people that everyone else follows because they're the ones on the front lines. They're the ones discovering new information. They're the ones that are discovering all the things that 50 years from now, we're going to be baffled that anyone could live without knowing that thing. And that is something that is so amazing and enticing about science, right? Because it's literally like you are a prophet, right? You get to see and experience the future before anyone else does. So it doesn't surprise me at all that... Um, that people who were involved in like inventions and science and engineering were known as witches or prophets like uh, Belle from Beauty and the Beast, right? She could have easily been burned at the stake as a witch. And what did she do? She, she was a girl who liked to read books, right? Isn't that just a classic fable about how information needs to be public, right? <laughs> Except for personal information, because that can be used to hurt people. But, like, information that can be used to help the world, that should be public. That should all be public. Anyone should be able to access that, no matter where they are in the world. And the internet is our start to making that kind of thing a reality. Um, so anyway, getting off my, my soapbox here. So... Shit like this, except published in 1904. See, this is probably the book that I found, right? Because this was published in 1904, but it says paperback 2001. That is because people still find value in this book. We have found nothing new since 1904 unless they added new stuff, right? Like, that is baffling to me. Like, we have all these books on diet fads. And all of these books, you know what they're centered around? They're not centered around being healthy. They're centered around being thin and hot and fuckable, right? This paleo diet, most of the people who go on paleo diet, now, there are some people who are just like health nuts, and they're just all like, yeah, I gotta be swole right? They just really like exercise or whatever. They're really sporty. Or um, or maybe there's like somebody who legitimately has some minor health problem. Like 
uh, some kind of minor food intolerances. They can live a mostly normal life. Um, they're not stuck in bed forever, but they will face very severe consequences if they don't follow a strict regimented diet, right? So those people also will get into specific, specific diets like paleo and whatever, uh, or, or, um, but see, scientifically, the purpose of diets and especially exclusion diets, they're not meant to be a diet that you follow for your whole life, right? An exclusion diet is meant when your guts aren't working. Let's go back to that uh, scientific process here. Scientific process, right? Your guts aren't working. Why the fuck aren't they working? Why aren't they doing their goddamn job, right? Let's go to um, cells at work and then find whatever little dude is controlling the switch to the stomach acid and fire that fucker. Like, <laughs> do your job. So do background research and learn what is already known about the topic. But when I got to this stage, all I found were fucking diet fads. Why can a sick person who is vomiting every meal and literally feels like they're dying, why can they not find a book on how to cook food so that it is easily digested, except for a book that was written in 1904, right? I guess this one is newer, but like I said, I don't know anything about this guy, so I, I can't just, like, trust that he's legit, you know? And people trust things when we hear about them often, right? So if the news is like going to celebrate this really great scientific discovery, then everybody is going to know about it. And that's actually one of the things that is like sort of flawed in some ways, because there's periods of time where like news outlets will catch on to like some tiny study, right? That is how the autism vaccine thing happened. Although I'm pretty sure that dude had a political agenda um, as well, right? Um... Wasn't he, like, in some sort of business with, uh, uh, right, right, search bar, autism, vaccine. Yeah, there was this really good thing. Was it from Adam Ruins Everything or H-Bomber Guy? H-Bomber Guy's also great. Um, I also like Last Week Tonight. So, these are all good videos. I'll share them, because they're good. But, uh... Yeah, H. Bomber Guy does great research, and um, he also is just really good at organizing his stuff into, like, digestible chunks. And I strive to one day be good at that, because I don't. I just stream of consciousness, word vomit, everything. Uh, and it's not organized in a way that's easy for other people to understand, and I'm trying to fix that. Maybe that's what, like, a highlights wheel will be. But um, in any case... So what I was trying to say with this, uh, let's, let's copy these into the Word document. So I've got cells at work, I got H bomber guy, that means I can close these out. Uh, we can do John Oliver vaccine, and then what was the other one that I wanted to curate for people? Um, this shouldn't be called dreams, this should be called curating, damn. So... All right, so vaccines and autism. So I said it was H bomber by, but I thought there was another one. Adam ruins Adam, Adam ruins everything. Vaccines. Yeah, Adam ruins everything is great. But wasn't there one on vaccines and autism? I feel like there was. Oh, come on, vaccines, my dude. No antibiotics, no. Adam ruins everything. Vaccines. Come on, do they really... Can I not find it? I feel like there definitely was one on vaccines, but maybe there wasn't. Hmm. Well, that's life. Sometimes you think you saw something and the memory is probably something else that just vaguely resembled that other thing and I'll never figure out what it was and I've made my peace with that if it's important it'll come back 
any case, Adam Ruins Everything is a good sh good channel. I recommend it. So maybe I'll maybe I'll save one of these. This one's vaguely related to vaccines. I'll just save this one. All right, got it. So anyway, what I'm saying is 1904. Am I right? Why is this still being published? I mean, I guess it's not that popular. It only has eight ratings. But let's pull up a diet book, right? So let's let's find paleo diet. Eh? So let's find paleo diet. 3,000. Never binge again. That's not exactly something. 1,000. And then uh, we can also look at, let's, keto diet. That's another one. Keto diet. So let's see how those are going for reviews, right? Uh, 26,000. That's, uh, that's some pretty intense stuff. Um, 4,000. Now, to be fair, um, a lot of diets do actually have a scientific basis. But when I say that diets, especially restrictive diets, are not meant to be used forever... What I mean is they're not meant to be used forever by the vast majority of people, right? So I have a teacher, um, my singing instructor, who controls her diabetes primarily through diet. She avoids sugars and carbs, and she gets more of her stuff out of fats, right? Um... That works for her. She feels fine. I'm not going to judge her for it, right? If if she doesn't feel that she needs any extra medical help and that the keto diet is doing it for her, meh. Maybe it's not that bad. Maybe she's maybe she's got a handle on it, you know? Whatever. She's not complaining. I'm not complaining. It's her health. She gets to decide. Um. So what I think it is is that Exclusion diets are not easy to make money off of, right? Because an exclusion diet by a nutritionist, the way it's supposed to work is it's just a method to discover whether or not you have an allergy that we can't test for, right? So now, in the modern day, we have blood tests and they also have these needle tests. I went to it once when I was trying to figure out why my lungs only uh, were 50% functional, right? The whole reason I took singing lessons is because if I take singing lessons, it acts as lung exercise, and I knew I wasn't going to use the dumbass exercise machine thingy that they wanted me to just blow into a tube over and over. That is so boring. Uh, singing is going to exercise your lungs just as good, and it's going to be more fun and less boring, and you're not going to want to give up on the mortal coil and join the choir eternal rather than continue blowing into this stupid tube for another minute. I don't know about you guys, but I get really bored. So, anyway, point is, um, companies love diets because they sell stuff to you, right? Corporations, they're merchants. Merchants are all about the business. They're all about the profits. That's why a society that where merchants are in charge of everything is a shitty society because it means that the poor die because they don't have anything to give to the merchants. Merchants need to learn how to be better sh shepherds, right? If all of your people are dead, uh, you have less people to profit off of. Maybe it's more profitable to profit off of the lower class than it is to profit off of the upper class, right? You're not a thief. You don't have to worry about their security. All you have to worry about is marketing, you know? Um, maybe poor people are easier to market to than rich people, and that's why they made the switch. But in any case, uh, who knows? Point being, it is actually better, um, like, to earn a little bit of money by selling goods to a lot of people, and it's more stable, uh, of an income, compared to having only a few deals with very wealthy people, and if those people decide to drop your contract, your business will be fucked. Truly and utterly fucked, right? It's much more stable 
to survive off of that. If you want to think about it in terms of like eco ecology, right? So let's go to uh, ecology pyramid, All right? So in human society, we can uh, we can kind of we can kind of get this right. So what we have here is the producers, which is the grass. In human society, this is whoever is producing the food. So that would be the farmers, right? Farmers are the producers of human society. And uh, anybody who hunts meat and sells the meat would be, if you grow a garden, then you're moonlighting as a producer. If you create something that can be made into something else, then you would be a producer. So along with that, that would also be um, miners and loggers, right? Miners and loggers would also be producers because they are literally in the process of taking the raw material from the goddamn rock that we live on, that we're squatting on, uh, where we were born and where we died and no one gave us permission to be here. We just exist and we have a right to exist and therefore here we are, right? So... We are taking the rock out of the dirt and we're turning it into other things. We're going to melt the metal down. We're going to build freaking skyscrapers and spaceships and we're going to go to the moon. And all of that starts from miners mining up the materials that we need to do all of that advanced science, right? Miners are one of the producers of industry, if industry is the ecological pyramid of humanity that we are looking at. You could also look at it based on science or whatever, you know. Um, <clears throat> so in any case, uh, loggers would also be, right? People need homes and they need clothes. And we have figured out how to turn both of uh, those into food and shelter, right? So the next level up is the primary consumers. So in wildlife terms, this would be the herbivores. Right. It's got a grasshopper here, but a cow would also be a primary consumer um, or a rabbit or, uh, you know, we classify deers as this, but deers actually will uh, eat baby birds and stuff. So maybe they would actually not fully fit into that category, but, you know, maybe they will be 90 percent here and 10 percent there. You know, diets are flexible. It's not just a on off switch. So um, anyway, point being that in human society, people who buy food would be here, right? So this would be um, every single person who buys food would fit into this category. Mostly that's going to be the lower class, right? Because the lower class does not make money off of, uh, they make money off of these guys. So hold on. I thought myself into a corner here. I got to correct my analogy to make it easier to understand for everybody. So, um, right. So producers are mining materials from the earth. Then this, this would actually be the craftsmen. I was lying to you guys about anyone who eats because, uh, everybody eats, even the CEOs, which would be like way up here. Um, they also eat. And if an eagle eats a grass, it doesn't suddenly become an herbivore, right? Things are classified by the highest level of other living thing that they prey on, right? So, um, yeah. So... This is kind of simplistic when you're thinking of humans because, like, for example, farmers also tend to not grow their own food often. Sometimes they do, but often they're not growing their own food. Often they are growing a cash crop and then they still buy food for the types of crops that they are not going to grow themselves, right? So, um, in any case... If you were to think of human society as an ecological pyramid, farmers would be at the bottom and then uh, craftspeople make things from the farmers, right? And then after craftspeople, who preys on the craftspeople? 
people who make the tools. So let's say craftspeople use wooden tools. Then a triple, then up here would be woodworkers. They make tools for, for a chef down here. But if the person here is like using metal tools, maybe the woodworker uses metal tools, then the woodworker would be here and then the smith would be here, right? And then if there's a landlord who owns the building that the smith is renting, then the landlord would be up here. And if the landlord is a part of a big landlording company, right? Uh, what's that called? Housing industry, real estate, right? So let's say they are owned by a real estate company, then the company would itself be a predator or maybe the CEO of the company, right? And then once you get into CEOs, CEOs, so maybe a company is here and then a CEO ab is above them because the CEO or maybe not, no, a monopoly, right? A monopoly is bigger than a company because a monopoly is a company that eats other companies. Yeah. So that's just a way of looking at human society in terms of ecological perspective. And one thing why this is important is that an ecological period pyramid is only ever in harmony when the bottom is larger than the top and actually below producers are the decomposers. So even more vital uh, than producers or just as vital, they're both vital, um, but there do need to be more decomposers typically um, compared to producers, right? That's why there's more bacteria that causes rot, etc. So decomposers need to be the biggest. And I can't believe none of these have decomposers on the list because decomposers are absolutely a vital part of the food, of the eco, eco energy permit, right? Ah, there they are. So they've got decomposers over here. See, decomposers eat everything, right? They'll eat corpses. They'll eat shit. They, they are not picky. These are the bottom feeders of the world, right? So in um, human society, decomposers are going to be people who work in recycling, people who work in, um, let's see, so recycling and sanitation would be, eh, nah, sanitation is more like they hunt bad bacteria. So we're not going to go, I don't know sanitation because you still throw away trash and sanitation leads directly into recycling so yeah we'll put them in in this category then uh decomposers would also include people who work at funeral homes and crematoriums right anybody who works in um what's it called it's not palliative care is it the one where people are dying and you're on your deathbed and they basically help you make peace with everything before you die, right? That one. Um, what's that called? Palliative care. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay, so palliative care is what I need, right? And then hospice care is for people who are dying, right? So I do not need hospice care because my condition is not terminal. I can live a very long life. I'm just, I need a lot of medical care during that long life that I have, right? A lot of medical care. Uh, Iron, Mouth, Iron Mouse joked about being a million dollar baby and it wasn't a joke. Yeah, that's a really common tale. Um, especially in America, I have a friend whose f whole family went into massive medical debt when he was born because he was a preemie baby and it literally cost between half a million and $2 million just to keep him from dying when he was born. And that wasn't covered by the government that just went into medical debt and it, it, f it was, it was bad. And he carries a lot of, uh, guilt 
for that too. Like he always feels terrible because he feels like his family was much wealthier before he was born and that he like his being born shunted them into poverty, which is not necessarily true. That's just how he feels, right? Um, it might have been that, you know, when he was born, they could afford it for a while and then an economic recession hit or somebody lost a job or somebody got injured or something, you know. Um, but he's a sensitive guy and he really loves his family. So he takes that kind of thing to heart, you know, because um, he's, you know, he's he's a really loving person. And sometimes that can cause our brains to hurt us more than it should, you know when you love other people and you want to do good by them and uh and you know that they're suffering you often feel like you have a responsibility to help them and if you can't help them then you feel like you failed them right and that's something that uh you know i've had to deal with with like my um my personal relationships like I've had people who are close to me be very upset and even neglect me for long periods of time not on purpose but just because being around me made them upset because I was sick and they didn't know how to help me and if they were in my presence just watching me felt like they had to, to watch me die that's how they felt and so they just cut me out of their lives slowly because they didn't want to watch me die. Um, and I wasn't going to die. So, you know, a little histrionic, sure. But that is how sick people get ostracized in society, you know. And I'm very thankful for the people who did stick with me. Because when I got sick in college, it's not as if people just go, Oh, you're sick? Disgusting. What happens is people say, Oh, you're going through so much. I know you're sick. So I'm not going to invite you to this event because I know that you can't walk and I'm not going to and I'm not going to um, change my activity. Right. If they're planning a group activity, then they'll be like, we're all going to go play Pokemon Go. You don't have a wheelchair and you can't walk. So we won't invite you because we don't have a way to bring you around. Nobody's going to carry you. Right. Um, and maybe in other situations where people are less disability friendly, maybe you do have a wheelchair and they leave you behind anyway because nobody wants to push you or maybe people are willing to push you, but they're not willing to let you push yourself. And maybe you don't like being pushed because it, it's uncomfortable for you, right? So they don't want to deal with you because you're slow. So they don't invite you, right? Because it's not convenient to include you in their regular activities. And most people stave off isolation by making social activity a habit, right? They do the same thing all the time. For 10 years, I had a local gaming group and we played tabletop role-playing games, right? And I was a regular player and sometimes a GM, but mostly a player. And... Even as a player, usually I was like a GM assistant. I helped them with organizing their notes. I did art for them. Uh, I did all sorts of stuff. And, you know, to this day, I still like to help out with uh, some things occasionally. Um, I did get really burnt out, though, because people in my group started sort of... They really liked my art, so they didn't do it on purpose. But they liked my art, and I kept giving them art when they wanted it and not saying no, so they kept asking for more, and eventually it got to the point where I just stopped drawing for years because I just felt like I was being treated like a machine, you know? Um, and nobody was trying to do that to me. It was just an unfortunate coincidence of circumstance, but that is exactly how you become isolated as a disabled person, right? It's not that anybody um, sets out to ostracize you. It's not that anybody just decides to stop being your friend. It's a very slow process of watching everybody that you know slowly abandon you, right? And generally, they don't abandon you on purpose. They just are like, we don't have any common interests anymore, so we don't have any reason to hang out. I really like sports. We used to play sports together, but then you got injured, and now you can't play sports anymore? Well... 
ode to our friendship, it's dead now, right? It just means that the people weren't that close to you. Because the people who stick with you are the ones who aren't just your friends because you're somebody to uh, keep them on their exercise routine, right? They're not just your friend because of what you can do for them. They're your friend because they valued you and they value who you are. And the truth is, friendships like that are really rare. Um, and it's sad, but it's been my experience. I think if you're especially charismatic and you're really good at expression and you're really good at psychology, um, maybe you can have really good deep friendships and, uh, and you also have a lot of intermediate friendships and maybe people move in and out of that frequently enough that you feel like your social needs are all being met. And maybe you're somebody who is really good at navigating social situations and reading the mood. And you're maybe not the best at like deep psychology, but you're pretty good at reading facial expressions and body language. And so everybody likes you. But nobody wants to be your best friend because um, you're boring, right? They're, they have no interests that they share with you. They don't have anything to talk about. You don't bring up anything interesting because uh, you don't for whatever reason, right? Maybe you don't like to talk that much. Maybe you're a quiet person. Maybe your throat hurts and speaking hurts so you speak less. Um, maybe you don't like your voice so you don't talk as much. Maybe your hobbies are really excluded, and so you don't talk about your hobbies. When I was growing up, I never talked about my hobbies to other people because I was a huge weeb, enormous weeb. And, you know, being a weeb now in uh, 2022, eh, not that big of a deal. You know what? A third of people are weebs now. Maybe a fifth, I don't know. But a sizable chunk, you know? Uh... Comic books, American comic books, used to be something that fucking Squares did, right? Now, MCU, Marvel Universe, is one of the top grossing films, uh, companies, ever. Like, they make so much money. But it didn't used to be that way. It used to be, uh, that these stories, if you mentioned them, you just got shunned. And that happened to me. You know, I was really into anime and manga, and I always wanted to talk about Dragon Ball Z and Pokemon and Sailor Moon, the three genders of uh, early uh, 1990s anime. <laughs> In my area, at least. So, um, you know, I stopped talking about it. And uh, I was just... I didn't have that many friends. The only reason I had friends was because I grew up in a rural area. And in rural areas, you make a friend in elementary school and then you stay in the same school with them until you graduate high school. Um, maybe you get split up by a different middle school if you live in different areas. So you end up being friends with people who are in the same educational districts as you, right? Because that's, that's just how it works, right? They left and went to another school and you didn't. And maybe you rejoin in high school and maybe you don't. And uh, you end up with childhood friends that you have nothing in common with. And absolutely nothing in common with. And maybe you don't ever talk about anything meaningful. Ever. You just sort of vibe. Because that's all there is. And there's not even any concept of like checking in with people or like talking to them and knowing who they are. And, and I'm sure things have changed, but that's just how it was in, in my rural community, right? Nobody, there were still boundaries of things that you don't tell anyone, even your closest friend. And that's something that I personally never understood because I'm a very information sharey person, right? My brain is super well vibed with the internet age. I can follow boundaries and rules. I just need to know what they are. And this whole uh, conversationalist thing where everybody knows the rules and they absorb it passively through their environment, I've always been really shit at that type of learning. So um, I don't learn things passively. I only learn things when I actively try to learn them. And that makes life really hard. 
when everyone expects you to just pick things up without having to try. Um, and the thing is that I could always learn things really fast when I did try. So I would, in school, get into this weird situation where I was called a gifted kid, but then I was also called a troubled kid because I would learn advanced concepts really fast, but I would struggle with the busy work. Um, and I, I wouldn't want to do the busy work. Some people, back in the day, they just called that being lazy, right? But it actually comes from the brain process and how the brain works, right? I learn really well when I'm actively engaged and focused on a task. And when I am trying to pay attention to the big picture, I don't learn well at all. Uh, my m recent medication has been changing that, which has been nice, but, you know, um, it's a thing. So we covered the ecology pyramid and palliative versus hospice care. So I was talking about medical stuff, wasn't I? Yeah, so this has been a long stream, so maybe I'll do more like highlight editing later. I really hate doing that, but I also apparently am really bad at keeping myself on task. So my point was the way I figured out how to feed myself is by reading system novels, ironically enough. So there is this specific genre of system novels that it's called that is like reborn in the 80s in China. Now, I am not a big history person. I'm just not, you know, it's not my deal. But I love sociology. Um, I love it. Sociology, how people work together. That's my bag. There is uh, this genre in Chinese novels where a person is reborn in the 80s. Why do they pick the 80s? Well, because it's usually somewhere between the 50s and the, the 80s, really. Because that was a period where China was undergoing um, an economic reconstruction. All right. Chinese economic reform. So this is what we got here. So during the Chinese economic reform, it was basically the opening of China, right? So if you've ever seen, if you're a big weeb like me, and you've seen some anime such as Samurai Champloo, and you've seen maybe uh, Sayonara Zetsubo Sensei or Farewell Mr. Despair, Mr. Despair um, people who have been like, into anime and manga for a long time will often use the Japanese title because when we were into it, the only people who were translating things into English were like niche fans. There was no officially published stuff in English or very few Dark Horse uh, comics. They were one of the first people to bring over anime and manga or like manga style comics from Japan, right? They were one of the first people and they've always been like that. They, they, uh, they've always been very off the beaten path, so to speak. I don't know about their recent stuff, but, um, they have been well known for that in the past at least, right? So they... They used to publish um, the very first manga I ever read, which was um, Ah My Goddess. So, Ah My Goddess. Yeah, so this is a really weird comic to get into when you're five. Because it is a seinen harem <laughs> romantic comedy <laughs> right um it is it is a very strange genre to have when your brain is not fully developed i did not understand what was going on at all um i didn't understand why that dude kept freaking out when he saw boobs 
Uh, and I didn't get why all of these women kept trying to trick him into touching their boobs. I was like, is this a prank? Do you think he's going to be embarrassed and you're enjoying his suffering? Like, what is happening here that I am clearly missing the context of? But at age five, I didn't really get it, you know? I mean, I guess I vaguely understood that it had something to do with sex, but I didn't... I didn't really understand, you know, I, I didn't, it didn't really sink in. So Sayonara Zetsubo Sensei has this like Admiral Perry meme that relates to the history, which is the whole reason I brought this up. So, uh, Zetsubo Sensei, and then we're going to look at Admiral Perry. Yeah. So, Commodore Perry, this is a, a reference to that history, right? So we can see how things tie together. Um, that's not the image, though. Ah, there we go. Yep, that's it, all right. Uh, I wonder if they have a video that I can just share with people. Because, like, he just... They, they're they making fun of this period of history where Admiral Perry was this dude who, like, opened Japan to the outside world, right? Because um, before that, Japan was very isolationist. And then if you look at, like, Samurai Champloo, Samurai Champloo is about this same thing, right? It's about the um, Meiji, Re was it called the Meiji Reformation, right? I think it is. Let's find the sign. Let's, let's fact check here. So Japan Meiji Re Restoration. Okay, so I guess they call it the Restoration. Yeah. Yeah, so this is the process of industrialization. When Japan opened itself up to foreign trade, it spanned both the Edo period and the beginning of the Meiji period, and during which time Japan rapidly industrialized and adopted Western ideals and production methods. So you can see that in Samurai Champloo. Um, for example, Samurai Champloo uses the idea of sunflowers a lot. In fact, that's the entire plot is that Fu, the main character, is looking for the uh, the samurai who smells of sunflowers, right? And she has this little skull uh, dangly bit, which is kind of reminiscent of, like, the Day of the Dead, right? So all of those are references to exports because sunflowers were heavily associated with Vincent van Gogh, and Samurai Champloo actually gets kind of uh, a lot of references to art history, right? They have a whole section dedicated to ukiyo-e, where Fu is, like, human trafficked and almost forced into prostitution by a dude who is an artist painting nude ukiyo-e pornography. And she thinks that she's getting into this and that this dude is flirting with her and she's willing to get naked in front of him because she wants to fuck him, right? But then he is actually a part of an underground criminal syndicate that is trafficking Japanese girls into other areas of either Japan or foreign countries. He is basically involved in the slave trade, right? For forced sexual prostitution. Um, you know, I think that's one of the reasons why sex work is so heavily stigmatized is because it has traditionally been tied in with the slave trade in a lot of places. Which is some interesting, interesting stuff. But you see a lot of, so many themes in Samurai Champloo directly relate to this opening of Japan and the Meiji, uh, the Edo period and Meiji era. Because in the beginning, you know, the whole thing that happens is that we have these, um, these two samurai guys, right? There's Jin, who was definitely my crush. And then there's uh, this Mugen, who's a hot fucking mess and morally 
bankrupt for the most part. I mean, Jin could also be a bit iffy on the morals, to be honest. Um, but in any case, so the whole thing is that during the Meiji Restoration, previous to that, there was like very feudal Japan and it was legal to carry around samurai swords, right? So that's the whole thing with Ronin. There were Ronin bandits that were like robbing people. And you see that in the movie. And what happened is they were in a rapid period of expanding governmental power and centralizing the government, right? So for this, the government was more decentralized. The emperor would come into power and exit power. And when the emperor was not in power, government would be decentralized. And that means that there's no power for, little power for the emperor. He's like a figurehead. And a decentralized government at that time meant that the noble families had all the power, right? So you were governed most by whichever noble family owned the land that you lived in. It's kind of like a system that values landlords the most and gives landlords the most political power. Um, and that was actually pretty similar to what happened in Europe. So there is, um, there's this really excellent book on drive through RPG and there's town and fief. So these, these are excellent books. Um, I have used them for research when I was doing, um, like making a video game that was meant to be kind of vaguely medieval European ambience, you know? Um, but I didn't want to do what most fantasy stories do, which is take the paint job of the setting and then ignore all the social aspects, right? I wanted to actually know how the heck it worked. And I found a bunch of cool stuff, like there were bathhouses that were also brothels and they were called soups. Isn't that bizarre? I guess it makes sense, but it's, it's very interesting. So in any case, definitely check out those books. I will post the links in the description later. This long chain of random shit I researched today. So history of Japan, industrialization, Western ideals. We talked about Vincent van Gogh and the explosion of art and ukiyo-e and how that interacted with Vincent van Gogh and, uh, you know, all this stuff. And we talked about how um, they outlawed samurai swords, right? So that's why these guys are always running from the police. Because before swords were outlawed, they were able to carry their swords in public and the, the people who taught them swordsmanship were able to just carry their sword in public and just kill people. As long as nobody witnessed it, there was no problem with that. And so the two of these were raised by their, their teachers in martial arts to expect, well, I guess he mostly learned on his own from like street fighting and stuff. But in any case, he's lived in a world where he's seen people be murdered all the time for no reason, and he's used to it. And he's been in this world where he was taught in a very structured society where you are allowed to kill people, but you're only allowed to kill people in duels. Now, the thing is, is he's trying to s figure out, uh, I think that there was some drama having to do with the murder of his master. I don't remember if he was involved or if there was some kind of political conspiracy with somebody trying to take over the dojo. And uh, I think he mostly just had a very tragic backstory and he's just been a loner the whole time because no one ever gave a shit about him since the day he was born. And so he just had to learn how to take care of himself, right? So um, both of them have this idea where they, throughout their education, they were raised to believe that it was totally fine to carry around a sword in public and then kill people who piss you off, Right? And then the Meiji Restoration comes in and they're like, we are not going to allow common citizens to have swords anymore. Only the government will have weapons. And we also have firearms. 
and we're going to strictly control these new firearms that are getting introduced to our country for the first time, but secretly have actually been on the black market for a while. We're just now recognizing it, right? Um, and they are really struggling with the idea of being outlaws in this new society where society has evolved and changed in a way that leaves behind an enormous part of their identity. And I think that that's something that a lot of people can relate to as they age because society does change and sometimes it changes for the better and sometimes it changes for the worse. For example, um, was it Iran, 1960s woman office photo was it iran or was it it was right so if you look at photos of iran in the 60s right iran had so much going on and they had so much education and so much freedom you can see women wearing their religious garb next to women not wearing their religious garb and they're walking down the street and nobody is harassing them here in this photo. I don't know how accurate that is to the lived experiences. Maybe somebody who is actually, you know, lived in that time could say, but you can see here that there are girls and women wearing, um, you know, uh, we see skirts here. I thought I saw one wearing pants, some women wearing pants earlier. No, mostly skirts, but still, I mean, these are pants, but there's like snow gear. Who wears a skirt for snow gear? That's ridiculous. Nobody's ever done that. Well, that's not necessarily true. But you can see the fashion is, is different and the uh, personal expression is different. And then um, if you look at the history of the Taliban, uh, history, so Iran, maybe? So Iran is not, Iran and the Taliban, mm -mm -mm. Iran's ambiguous rule. I am not educated enough for this. Um, what I was trying to say is that a very violent and bigoted cult basically took over at some point in some countries. I mean, to be fair, it could be argued that that happens in the U.S. at certain points. Um, like, with all the people who stormed the Capitol and tried to stage a coup because they were mad that uh, their emotional support vegetable didn't get elected president. Um, <laughs> anyway... <laughs> I think emotional support vegetable is now my favorite political euphemism. So anyway, um, point is history and civil rights doesn't only go forward. It also goes backwards, right? Um, I don't know enough about Iran, so I'm going to ignore that. I've been weeby, so I know a little bit more about Japan, but still not great. I know the most about the U.S. I had the most access to information about the U.S., and therefore that's what I know the most about. So what I know is in the U.S., 1920s, women's fashion. Let's, let's look at this real quick, right? So let's look at women's fashion. You can see women are showing more skin. Uh, they really liked elongated waistlines that were more masculine. What happened is in uh, the World War I, so many men went into war that the women were forced to take up factory jobs. And by forced, I mean they were allowed to for the first time because the country needed them. And it decided that it was a waste of resources to keep the women home as housewives, right? 
Uh, there weren't enough people to keep the country functioning because they were losing too many people to war. And so they were basically forced into allowing women to work. Now, that was not a permanent situation. If you look at 1940s fashion, so the reason for that is that what happened is after the war, we had in the U.S., what is known as the Great Depression. And a lot of people fucking starved to death. So 1940s fashion compared to 1920s fashion. So we saw a lot of sleevelessness, a lot of skin, a lot of décolletage. You know, we had these long waists. And then when you look at 40s fashion, we started getting into this kind of cinched waist and the skirts are a little bit longer. People aren't really showing cleavage as much. And when you get into 1950s fashion, female fashion, men's fashion has been more stable. Uh, you can see that we're kind of following the same kind of trend here, right? So 1950s. Oh, this is great. I love this. Uh, where's the artist? Let's Let's find the artist for this. Google Lens, find me the original source. Yes. Is it this one? No. Rudeness. Well, whatever. I'll just include it. This one seems pretty good, even though it's not the source of the fic picture that I wanted. Um... So, I wonder if the fashion timeline, do they have, give me the 1920s, please. Ah, uh, yes, perfect, cool, so I'll include that. So, you can see how uh, the Great Depression happened in the 30s through the 40s. And a lot of people starved. People were terrified. They were in economic insecurity. Everybody was panicked. No one was happy. Um, and during that period of time, we lost a lot of rights. And we've seen that happen in the U.S. several times. Um, in my lifetime, I can think of a few, right? So the very first time that I remember this happened was the Patriot Act. I believe that was... George W. Bush, who my parents voted for. And at the time, there we go, surveillance under the Patriot Act, right? This hugely eroded the individual uh, U.S. citizen's right to personal privacy and greatly expanded government power to spy on the people and also to hold people in a uh, prison, like, indefinitely, with little to no evidence, as long as the trial kept getting rescheduled. Um, bail systems are a part of that. Bail is terrible, and at the very least should scale with percentage of your income and not based on flat dollar values, which just mean that the rich people can get out of anything, right? That's some bullshit. And it was primarily used for the war on drugs, which is what Clinton did with it after uh, Clinton took over, right? So here we have the Republican Party uh, greatly expanding governmental power, and they use things that Republicans like, which is Republicans like to feel safe, right? Right? They are a skittish folk, we like to say. They believe that the world is a dangerous place. And they, they don't want the government except when the government is needed to provide brute force. That is the party line of the Republican Party, right? They tell you that you will be safe because if you give us money, we will invest in the police and the military. And the military means that other countries will not make war on American soil 
and cause all of your people to die and starve. And police means that if you are wealthy, poor people will not be able to steal money from you in order to feed themselves, right? That is pretty much the purpose of the police. Um, we acknowledge that we are letting our population starve and have forced them into criminal behavior because the economic system is flawed. And instead of solving that problem with public funding, we have decided to instead invest in military and spying on our own people and policing our own people and giving the government to just fucking execute people in public and then get away with it as long as they can say that they were scared for their lives. Whether or not that's true, no one can prove it. You can't prove fear, right? So that is one of the big losses, in my opinion, to um, civil rights in the U.S. That happened during my lifetime, right? I was in elementary school when 9-11 happened. Everybody was afraid. There was terrorist activity. I think it was part of the growing planes of gro globalization, right? Um, as media outlets change, people are, of course, going to try to use it for their own political gains. And unfortunately, very violent um, political groups did do that. You know, um, it's not just religious groups. Religious groups are often political, but it is political groups that are doing it, you know. Um, like that one dude who was an asshole and he made this manifesto about how women didn't fuck him and therefore if he shoots them up they deserve it um i'm not gonna say his name even though i remembered it because he doesn't deserve to be remembered for his name you know uh this just deserves to be a page in history of humanity where bad people did bad things and then eventually died in obscurity the way that they should. That's my opinion anyway. So, point being, it is a factual statement that individual rights for specific groups of people, such as women or people of color or uh, gay or trans people, fluctuates. It gets better and it gets worse. You know, in the modern day, one thing that we've seen more is uh, a lot of anti-trans and anti-gay bills. Um, I don't know why that is. Maybe it's just an unhappy coincidence because of incompetence combined with ignorance combined with malice or just disgust. Eh? I brought it back. I brought it back to the disgust thing I was talking about earlier that I never finished talking about because I can't stay on topic. Um, in any case, Samurai Champloo, Sayonara Zetsubo Sensei, the Chinese economic reform was a period of time similar to the Meiji Restoration period, uh, where China was starting to do business with the outside world, really, right? And they previously had this system, which I'm not super educated on. I've just read a lot of fiction novels set in this time period, so you kind of absorbed general ideas. So what happens in these stories where somebody is reborn in the 80s, any of, except maybe that one, uh, most of these are book covers for reborn in the 80s. Um, I've read quite a few of these. And the idea is that there's a modern person who really understands the history of China in the 80s because they learned it through formal education. They're usually a Chinese citizen who finds themselves transported into the body of some person living in the 80s. Usually it is a, like, possession of that person's body. So either the idea that they reincarnated backwards or they, um, I don't know. It's Sometimes it's just not explained because it doesn't matter how it happened. What matters is the fact that it did happen is interesting, right? That's uh, pretty much the entire concept of why isekai has evolved into an enormous genre. 
um, and why truck coon gets used so much because it's just an excuse. Nobody really cares. You know, this story with Truck Coon isn't about how this happened. It's like Zombieland Saga. We're never going to find out why all of these girls became zombies. And if we do, it won't be until the end. Why? Because it's not important. What is important is a bunch of girls who died and then got a second chance of, at life as idols. That's literally all it is. It could be about a dude who goes around gathering, like, pretty girls who are impoverished and then tells them that he's going to make them all famous because they're talented and they just didn't get a chance because they weren't born into money. And he gives them lessons and he funds them and then he turns them into this giant idol industry. That could be the exact same story. They just decided to go with the comedy horror spin of, what if they were zombies? That would be funny. What if her head pops off in the middle of a show? How are they going to hide that? You know? Um, that's kind of the deal with that show. So isekai is the same thing. Often, it really doesn't matter. It just doesn't. To your enjoyment of the show. You know, somebody could have been cursed. They could have dimensional hopped. The only reason it matters is in how it affects the main character. Are they able to travel worlds? In most isekai... The answer is, it was an accident, or they were kidnapped by a god, or it happened and it was a natural phenomenon and they have no control over it. Point is, they're now stuck in this situation and they have no way of getting out of it, so they just have to learn to live. You know, and uh, Genshin Impact has this quote by Yai Miko on isekai stories. And... Uh, Yai Miko says something along the lines of, like, Yeah, stories about people going to other worlds are all the rage these days. I wonder why. What is it that they're so disappointed about the real world? But I don't see it to be like that. What I think is that my generation and the people who are close to me in age, the people who are alive at this point in time, who have a specific way of looking at the world, what we've done is we have inherited a fucking shit pile. And we didn't make this world, right? We weren't raised in this world, and we feel like we have no context for living in the society that we're raised because we didn't get to make the rules like our ancestors made the rules and those rules fucking suck right so what really is happening here in my opinion is people are coming to terms with the fact that we have inherited ancestral sins if you want to put it into a christian perspective you could say we're coming to terms as a species with original sin uh, if you want to put it into environmental perspective, we're coming to terms with the idea that the earth is going to be no longer inhabitable to humans if we don't act on it and fix it now. If you want to put it in social perspective, we're coming to terms with the fact that human history is drenched in blood and rape and torture. And a lot of our ancestors were the perpetrators or the victims, or both of those things. And we have to determine how the fuck are we going to live in this really fucked up world that we didn't make and we didn't choose to be in. Someone just decided that they were horny and then, like, ejaculated into somebody else's womb and suddenly I'm stuck here having to solve the problem of how, of how to keep... Uh, everybody from suffocating and choking on toxic water. I'm like, damn, this is a big problem to culturally and speciesly inherit, right? Because uh, the animals in the world that make up the ecosystem aren't putting this type of stress on themselves, right? They're going to live or die based on whether they have enough food. Humans have evolved a society that is more complex than that. And we are not, we are still living and dying based on how we have enough food because we haven't eliminated poverty yet. But we have a dream and our dream is 
that one day people won't have to do that anymore, right? In my opinion, that is one of the pivotal differences in humans so far that we could tell because we can't talk to animals, so who fucking knows what they're thinking, right? Uh, maybe we'll make some progress on, like, translation devices. I've seen some cool shit with, like, training your dogs and cats to press buttons. Hey, Korotun, welcome home. You want to join the stream? I've just been rambling in a giant thought stream for several hours now. Uh, that's fair. Uh, all right. Well, in any case, I'll try to sum up this and then probably end the stream because I have been talking for a while. And I have to say, my singing lessons are excellent because normally my throat would be in a lot of pain by now. But because I've been taking my vocal lessons and they teach you, it's basically like personalized physical therapy for your throat that teaches you how to move your throat in a way that doesn't cause stress. Only if you get a good teacher. There's a lot of shitty ones out there. So obviously you've got to be careful about that. My teacher is really good. She has operatic training and jazz. And those are like the two extremes in the world. So if anybody specializes in both opera and jazz, you know that they're going to be excellent. <laughs> um, those are two very different skill sets. So anyway, Reborn in the 80s is a very similar thing to Samurai Champloo because, or no, to Isekai. Yeah, Isekai, because, Samurai Champloo, because it's about an important turning point in economic history. It is the equivalent of Samurai, Samurai Champloo because Samurai Champloo is about the opening of Japan and uh, Rebirth in the 80s is about the opening of China, right? And it's also a, kind of a dream about, like... When everything was in the process of industrialization, a lot of people got ridiculously wealthy because new things were happening that other people weren't on board with yet. Um, one thing that Yaimiko, about Yaimiko's world, words that really made me think is we really like historical fictions because we have this idea that if we already know what's going to happen, we would be able to uniquely take advantage of that time period and then carve out a better life for ourselves and our families. And there's this idea that in the modern world, we're not able to do that because we can't see the future. But the thing is, we can see the future, right? That is literally the purpose of science. The purpose of science is to be able to predict the future with accuracy. And I think all of these are really just about people coming to terms with the fact that, like, the information age and globalization and the idea that there's all these problems which before people maybe didn't know about because they never had access to talk to somebody at 3 a.m. in Australia. If you were awake at 3 a.m., you just had to sit there by yourself with your thumb up your ass because there was nobody to talk to, right? But now we're being exposed to people from completely different lives from ourselves in a way that we really didn't before. Like, we did in certain areas, in diverse areas, but a lot of people lived in pockets of um, non-diversity, monotony, heterogeneity, whatever the word is called, right? Or not hetero, homogeneity. Yeah, hetero is diversity, homo is not. Ironic. It's the opposite in sexuality. <laughs> anyway, so... Um, this this genre connects the two concepts is what I'm trying to say, right? And I've been reading a lot of these because uh, China has an amazing literary culture, which is not surprising if you've looked anything into their history. Um, but yeah, it's really great. So a last thought is earlier on I was talking about fat, acid, balance, and the feeling of disgust. And I think disgust is the same as every other emotion that humans have. In that if it's not well regulated, it has a job and it has a purpose, right? What is the purpose of anger? 
The purpose of anger is to give you strength to do what you need to do, right? Anger gives you strength. But if you're applying that strength in the wrong place, then anger can also turn you into a monster. And disgust is the same way, right? Because if you feel so disgusted by other people that you are willing to kill them or you're willing to take away their rights and you're willing to not let them live, that is a fast way of turning yourself into a monster. Um, it just is, right? Um, and, and we as a society need to balance that. And I'm not trying to say something about like, we have to learn to tolerate the Nazis. They have a right to their opinion too. That's some bullshit. And some people believe in that. And I fight against that with every fiber of my being. Because when somebody is treating a victim and a bully the same, then what you're doing is you're creating an environment based around bullies. And anyone who's been bullied in school understands that, right? Anybody who's been victimized understands that. So that is not a good way for a society to function. You have to decide where the line is and you have to constantly reevaluate that line about what should be acceptable and where, right? In your personal relationships, you need to be checking in with your, your, your people and being like, they're upset. I wonder why that is. Be curious about people and think and, and be open-minded, right? Like when you have rejection sensitivity, for example, um, or other like mental health problems like anxiety and depression and all of this stuff can kind of clump together. You know, usually you don't have just one. You have like a bunch, unfortunately. Like for myself, I have autism, ADD, uh major depression, but it's very well treated right now. Um, PTSD. Um, possibly a disassociative disorder, but not, not a well-known type. Um, so like, what I'm trying to say is that it's all just about something that is meant to do its job and isn't doing its job and therefore it is causing trouble to you, right? So a viral infection is when an enemy from outside of your body is hurting you because it's trying to use you to feed off of its to live, right? But... A lot of problems are not that type of problem. And I think a lot of people struggle with this idea of us versus them because they look at a problem and they will always turn it into the good guys versus the bad guys. And I think Christian dominated countries are especially susceptible to this just because the religion has formed the psycho babble of, of our population more and Christianity is very black and white, uh, not always when practiced, but the dominant types that have spread, right? Um, and if you look at, I was just researching the history of Christianity the other day because I wanted to generate religions for my game. So this was about the formation of Protestantism. And, yeah, overly sarcastic productions. I love them. Red and Blue. Both both wonderful. Uh, I personally will watch Red more often, but I do occasionally dabble into Blue when there's a topic that I find to be of interest. Um, let me save a couple of these, because these are pretty good. If you live in the Northern Hemisphere and have stepped outside as of late, you've probably... Re All right, so I'll add these to my list which will go into the YouTube description. Hi there, my name is John Green. This is Crash Course World History, oh, and today we're going to talk about Jesus. So this is a John Roman Green's coin. Great. Hi there, my name is John Green. This is Crash Course World History, and today we're going to talk Crash about Course the Crusades. Oh, stand so we're just going to save those. 
So for anybody who wants to learn more than my weird ramble, you will have it. But basic idea is in the history of Christianity, um, there was Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Jerusalem is most likely where Christianity had like started. I think that's pretty guaranteed to be where it started. And uh, the Romans, Christianity entered Rome as like an outside religion to the people, right? And the people, the specific Christians that stood out more than the other Christians who were all living peaceful, happy lives were the radical, violent group, right? It's like the difference between Muslims who are generally good people and rational and don't hurt others and, uh, you know, Muslims um, and Middle Eastern countries, like the first college in the world, um, I think was like Fatima, Fatima Woman College, right? Yeah. Fatima University, Fatima College. No. First College History. Aha. There we go. This is what I was looking for. So I was looking for um, Fatima al Fahir. Fury? Fatima al Fury? Sorry, I'm, I'm not good at pronouncing, but I'm doing my best and I'll do research later to make myself better. Um, so she was a Muslim woman in Tunisia who founded the first known university more than a thousand years ago, right? So, like, Muslims are not a religion of violence. They are a religion of vast knowledge and wisdom and beauty. And I think all religions start out that way. Because what happens is somebody wants to share something great. And they do. They want to improve each other's lives, right? Um, well, maybe not all religions start out that way. Some religions uh, start out because somebody wanted to get rich. but um, <clears throat> And they decided that suckers... They decided that religious ties would be really easy to embezzle. That's what happened. Yeah. So that, that also happens. Yes, we will agree to that. But the majority of the time, I would say, when a religion starts, it starts because somebody sees something that is good and they want to share it with somebody else, right? And, and they, want to, they want the world to be a better place. They're like, what should you not do? You shouldn't murder people. And you, you shouldn't cheat on your wife or husband. And, um, you know, slavery took a little bit longer in some places, but, uh, getting there. So, the Romans first experienced Christianity as, like, terrorists. And then when the, t what would happen is they, the Christian terrorists would gather at a Colosseum. And then they would be like, let's see how many people we can stab, right? Ancient time version of mass shootings. Same fuckers. Making the world worse for everyone. Should be universally reviled, shunned, and then rehabilitated. Um, and, and made to give reparations for the damage that they have caused, right? So, they, the Romans... Uh, we're, we're not big on, uh, giving due justice to s psychos, asshole, douchebag, McGee, dangerous cultist jerks, um, who also happened to be Christian, and they just tossed those dudes into the lion's den, like, into the arena to get eaten by the lions, because they were like, you can't just stab people. We're trying to run a business here. We're trying to make money. It's like if somebody showed up to a football stadium and then just started, like, shooting everybody, except in the middle of the football stadium is a bunch of wild animals that they watch eat criminals for fun. So, <laughs> interesting times. But then that turned into the historical uh, Christian myth of, we have been so persecuted, the, the horrible and evil polytheists 
persecuted our people and tossed us into the lions just for being Christian. No, you asshole, you were tossed into the lions because you stabbed 13 people and then, like, murdered this woman in front of her children. Damn. Like, fuck, guys. So, anyway, my point is, uh, things need to be taken in context and, like, while a woman of a Muslim religion gave the world an amazing gift of that college that she started, um, every religion and every philosophy is weak to um, just starting to celebrate bad people and putting them in charge and when you put shitty people in charge, the entire organization starts going downhill, right? So something will be a cult as long as the leaders of that religion do not recognize those people. And they're like, nope, you're excommunicated from the church. And they'll be like, fuck you, we made our own church with uh, blood sacrifice and like murdering our enemies with no due process. And, like, defunding public education, right? <laughs> like, the churches would have scribes that didn't know how to read. Uh, and so typos were obviously rampant, because that's a thing. Anyway, so... I don't know. Random rant about all of that, and how anger, disgust... Uh, even happiness, you know, like toxic positivity, right? Toxic positivity. That is when people get too into, um, you know, policing the vibes and no one's allowed to be sad anymore and no one's allowed to be angry. It's like respectability politics at its finest, right? And, and sadness, when it gets too far, well, that's how you get suicide cults, isn't it, right? People are just like, this world is not worth living in anymore. Only heaven, or whatever the goal is, uh, is, is where we want to be, right? Um, that's the only place we can be, uh, and this world is so awful, it's not worth saving. That's, that's what it ends up being. And our lives are so awful that they are unrecoverable. But that's not true, you know? And when you're mentally ill and you have depression, uh, you often feel like that's true. But it's not. And the world is capable of change. And sometimes it will change for the worse and you can't control that. And sometimes it will change for the better purely on accident. Um, but most of the time, if you want the world to change for the better, you have to do it yourself. So um, if you find yourself feeling disgust when you're looking at another person, maybe uh, take a minute and think about what exactly is it about them that they discuss that disgusts you, right? Like, and is that something that's worthy of disgust? Um... If you see two men uh, kissing and that causes you feelings of disgust, ask yourself what that's hurting, right? Are those two people hurting anything? Are they destroying anything that you believe in? And if they are, what is that thing that you believe in that they're destroying? What is it exactly? Don't take something vague like, you know, the Bible says it's a sin. Because that's only applicable if you don't believe in freedom of religion, and you believe everyone should have your religion, right? So try to think of something more specific than that, more specific, that something that you are disgusted in about that person, right? If you see somebody who's fat, why are you disgusted in them? Are you disgusted in them because you think that they're lazy? But the truth is, being fat doesn't mean that you're lazy. Usually, it means that there's something going on with your health. And you don't have the education or the help to fix it, right? That's why 
we've spent so much money into researching obesity because it's not about laziness and it's not about personal responsibility, no matter who tries to tell you that. It's simple science, right? If something is so hard to do that the vast majority of people will never accomplish it and they'll just die of diabetes, well, the answer is not that those people deserve to die. The answer is that we needed to make structures so that those people did not die, right? And diabetes runs in my family, and I have lost several family members to diabetes. So that is definitely something that's close to home. But the answer to that is not to just shame people, right? The answer is to figure out what is wrong. Is somebody binge eating because they're depressed and their body is telling them that they need to store up food because they're so miserable that there must be a famine coming, <laughs> right? That is how the body works. The body is both brilliant and stupid, just like a machine, right? A game is not going to program itself. You have to program it. But if you program it well, it will work beautifully. And if you program it shittily, it's going to work really bad. And bodies are just like that. But some people's innate programming are just shittier than other people's. I am one of those people. And I have to reprogram my body using medication. And the medication is just like code that I introduce as a patch. But the thing is, I have to keep patching it because it hasn't quite learned how to do that for itself. And maybe in the future, medicine will move into that direction. Using medication to train our bodies into producing what we need without external help. That would be amazing. But for now, that kind of ability is not widely dispersed. Maybe that will come with CRISPR. Maybe it will come with some new medical thing that we'll learn about the human body. Um, for now, that's not the case. So what happens is I search, what food can I eat? And the answer I get is, do you feel fat? Do you think that somebody wouldn't want to fuck you if they looked at you? That is a way of living worse than death. It's not. They just want to sell me things. Right? So, one reason I really like this fault, fat acid salt heat book, Salt Fat Acid Heat, is because it made me think about food differently. And it made me think about food in terms of what its core components were in a way that's way more accessible than a nutritional book. And because of that, I was finally able to help myself when all of my doctors failed me. I was able to be like, ah, the reason why I can't come up with a single type of food that I'm allergic to is because it's not an issue of that. What happens is I need to have more fat or more acid at any given moment in time. And if I need more acid or more light foods, as I would call it before, then I am not going to be able to eat something that's really fatty and really oily. I'm going to vomit if I try to eat it. But on the other hand, sometimes I really need the extra fat. And when I really need the extra fat, if I eat an acid, something that's acidic, it's also going to make me really sick. And it's going to cause my GERD uh, to act up, which is basically heartburn on steroids. And I'm going to be really having a bad time. And in addition to fat and acid, I think that there's a real gap here where we can think about food in terms of engineering materials, right? So in engineering, we discuss the elasticity of something, which is how much it is able to stretch before it permanently de uh, deforms. And the plasticity of something as well, which is something's ability to bend without breaking, right? Um, and then there's all sorts of other stuff, different types of strength. And so in terms of food, what I think really matters for triggering your sense of disgust is the color of the food, right? Because if something's the wrong color, then your lizard brain is going to tell you it might be poisonous or rotting, right? Like green eggs and ham. 
just like the Dr. Seuss book. And the smell, right? Because if something smells bad, it also might be rotting. Now, it's not a foolproof method because there's some things like stinky tofu or blue cheese or uh, durian. Things that smell really pungent but actually are fine. And that's because all of those use the smell to ward off predators, right? But they're not uh, warding us off, so we eat them and we're fine. You know, we're fine. Unless you have a specific sensitivity, I guess. Um, and also, I think, in addition to that is the liquid content, right? So if you study animals in nature, different animals drink different amounts. So a lot of carnivores don't drink very much. They get a lot of their liquid from uh, blood and viscera like they just eat the meat raw and they drink its blood and they're just like nom 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 and then they get a lot of liquid from their diet that way right and desert animals are more likely to get more of their food uh their water from their food rather than water sources because there aren't available water sources except at oasis and not everything can live in the middle of an oasis right <laughs> so um <clears throat> And in addition to liquid content, I think texture is a big thing, right? So whether something is really dense, you might choke on it. But if something is not dense enough, you also might choke on it. <laughs> and if something has chunks in it, right? Chunks get processed differently by the sensory nerves in your throat. So maybe if there's a big chunk in your food, you're going to think, oh no, chunky milk, it's gone bad, disgust, right? Um, and other times, all it is is freaking raisins and bread. Holy shit, chill out, dude. I don't need to vomit because there were raisins in my bread. <laughs> raisins are not going to hurt me. But my brain thinks it's the same thing as chunky milk a lot of the time, you know? Um, so that's one of the reasons why, you know, I had to study so hard because with my physical body, well, I can't just tell my stomach not to feel nausea. I can if I have medicine, right? But, uh, if I have to take the nausea medicine five times a day, every day, that's going to be a little bit taxing on my liver maybe, you know? Um, and instead, if I just learn how to eat the way my body wants me to eat, as long as I'm not having malnutrition, eh, it's probably going to be fine. Just other people are going to think that I'm picky eater and rude because I don't want to vomit, but they just don't understand because they don't, they don't live in my body and they don't understand how much pain I'm in all the time, right? If I'm only going to be a four or a five on the pain scale, I just eat it anyway because all food causes me pain. I just avoid the food that's going to be up into the sevens and the eights because that's the point where I'm like, Having a hard time concentrating on other things. All right. So with that, I think I've uh, streamed myself out for today. I did accomplish my original goal, which was uh, creating these. And then I spent a lot of time rambling around random stuff instead of moving on to the next project. So that is an area where I could improve to better move from one task to the next task in a fluid motion that is going to better uh, accomplish the goals that I want to accomplish. Oh, right. Here's the whole thing about how Texas picks the books for the entire United States and decides what everyone else in every other state gets to learn in school which is not ideal. I don't know if I already put that in here. All right, notes. I got it. Now with that, I've closed out of this weird rambling thought process. And uh, yeah, well, thank you for anyone who has decided to stick with me. I see one person at least. 
So hello to you and thank you. Um, I hope that you enjoyed the stream. And anyone who watches this now or in the future and any topic I brought up that you were like, you never finished that story. Uh, just tell me, you know, if you comment, I'll bring it up again. If you don't comment, it will be lost into obscurity. It's like your way of deciding what content should be on the channel or not, right? Um, so yeah. All right. Stay curious. Stealing that tagline. <laughs>